Good morning. Welcome to Friday morning plenaries. I hope you all had plenty of coffee. I'm glad there's a Starbucks right downstairs. We have a wonderful group of plenary speakers this morning. Um, I would like to introduce Dr. Jan Millsaps, Professor Emeritus at San Francisco State University, and she will be speaking on Model Mars. I'm going to flip the shirt. Sorry. All right, let's try this. Marsan, you got the memo, yay. Um, one of my partners on this project just texted me and said that we have 428 people connected online as well as you guys in the audience. So hello to Martians everywhere, Marsan. Um, to be a little more specific, Marsan is a greeting. Uh, so we were actually speaking Martian just now. Um, Mars, Mars, Model Mars is a program, an application, a platform that allows young people all over the world to envision and build futures on Mars. Um, so one of our youth teams, when we ran the prototype a few months ago, invented the word Marsan as an all-inclusive greeting, uh, a wish of well-being, kind of like aloha or shalom. So now you know, anytime anyone says Marsan, you say Marsan back, Marsan. Okay, now we can continue. Um, all right, uh, Model Mars takes place in the year 2075 on Mars. That's quite a quite a leap from now, and you may wonder why we we chose that particular year. We actually just chose approximately fifty years in the future because we figure by then um, people may will have settled into their lives on Mars. Uh, a lot of the heavy lifting will have been done. Um, uh, we want to thank all the engineers and the electricians and mechanics and designers and everybody else who built the infrastructure and made sure that we can live our Martian lives comfortably, uh, securely, so we don't have to worry about dying every day. And we now have time to spend thinking about, you know, how will our lives on Mars evolve? Uh, what kind of governance systems? How will we communicate? How will we buy and sell things? Or will we even buy or sell things? A lot of questions to be answered about our futures on Mars. So that is what the Model Mars Project is all about. Um, Here's one of our teams. This is our team from Kenya. Uh, they're working on their, pro their Model Mars project. It's a STEAM platform that's STEM plus the arts um, in which young people have a uh, virtual experience of being on Mars. And they work with a team of other youth Martians. And this is our Brazil team. They're the ones that came up with Marsan. And uh, what they do is, is, is they work collaboratively to solve a problem and it all co collectively helps us figure out how life on Mars might evolve. Uh, and then full circle, how that might translate back to improving lives on Earth. So that's what, in a nutshell, what Model Mars um, is all about. Here are a few quotes. We, uh, we ran the prototype a few months ago. I'm going to show you some details from the prototype. Uh, whatever, what actually happens when you let this thing you, loose with uh, young people all over the world. Uh, and then we polled our participants afterwards, and these are a few of the quotes we got um, helping us figure out kind of what's working, uh, anything we might be able to do differently or improve. So we're working on the next iteration right now. This is, uh, these are kind of the components that go into the Model Mars experience. It's kind of like storytelling meets fiction, meets science, science meets science fiction, meets collaboration, meets futuristic thinking, meets world building. We tried to put a lot of different things in this because we really wanted young people to be able to explore Mars in all of these aspects. The way it works is we start with stories. So um, we had very, short mini stories written. Um, I'll show you the storytellers in a moment. And 
By design, the stories are left unfinished because the whole point of Model Mars and the teamwork on Model Mars is that you figure out how to finish the story. Every story sets up um, a conflict or a challenge or an issue that needs to be addressed. Um, the next part, uh, after they uh, kind of un unpack the story and figure out what needs to be done is that they, they become, they role play, they become characters in the stories. They organize themselves as a team, and then they go on what we call journeys, which is like a quest or a mission. And they, along the way, explore, they research, they discuss, they try things, they try more things until they figure out what they think is the best approach uh, to challenge to, to solving the problem or addressing the challenge. At the end of this journey, as we're calling it, uh, each team creates a representation. Uh, of what its journey was like. And this can be anything. It can be art, it can be performance, it can be uh, data, it can be uh, menus, it can be anything, anything that they think represents uh, their Model Mars experience. I'm gonna show you some examples in a few minutes. Uh, and then they write a short narrative kind of explaining why this artifact, and that's how they finish the story. At the very, very end, Everybody gets together and one big virtual uh, con convocation convening and they report out. So every team reports out, uh, they unveil their artifacts and then we show them uh, <laughs> what they can do with their artifacts, which is a virtual museum on Mars, which I'll also show you in a moment. This is my team. We, we are co-founders, co-developers. Uh, we represent a wide range of experience. Jen Breslin had a many years at the United Nations. She brings the concept of Model Mars. If, you, if you're familiar with the Model UN, it's when young people come from all over the world, come together to solve problems globally. Uh, so we're kind of taking that idea to Mars. Rocky Rajani is a, uh, an engineer, a researcher. I have, she's a futurist. Um, she's a psych psychologist. She does all kinds of things working in the private industry for uh, some very high profile companies. Jen Blank is a NASA planetary scientist. She uh, works with uh, Martian-like environments on Earth to learn about Mars. And then there's me, Jan Millseps. I'm standing up here telling you all of this stuff. That's my role, I guess. Um, just so you'll know, we, we recruited people from all over the world. These are our prototype partners. Envoys were the people who worked most directly with the youth teams. Advisors were people that helped us out in many other ways, all extremely valuable. Uh, these are this is our creative team. Uh, we we had people to specifically write stories about, around specific issues that we were thinking about. Um, so our our storytellers uh, came up with the the concepts for the stories, and then we found this amazing map maker Nicole Barbadilius, uh, who works at the University of Arizona in to, where is that Tucson? Yeah, and she works with the high rise imagery. So what we were able to do was describe in general where we wanted our Martian settlements to be. And she came up with this very detailed map, which is amazing. Uh, so the green, the green parts show you where uh, uh, missions have actually landed on Mars. We were being hopeful about Rosalind Franklin, so we put it in there. We hope it's gonna get there uh, sooner or later. But then the red, the red arrows are where our fictional settlements are. And um, she figured out exactly like we we had one settlement that's underground in a lava tube so that's the rexy tube she put it she put it in a part of mars where there're likely to be a bunch of lava tubes so she was very good about matching our um fictional ideas for where people would settle on mars uh, with actual mars locations and we named them after people who have been instrumental in the history of Mars exploration. If you don't know who any of these people are, you can ask me. The one that might be least familiar to you is Rexy Leonard, but um, she's almost the love of my life. Um, she was a uh, Percival Lowell's assistant at the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, and she was one of the first women to study and publish uh, about Mars. So um, you probably know who the other people are. Donna Shirley uh, designed the first rover, Sojourner, and of course you know who Elon is, and Mimi Ong designed the uh, Ingenuity helicopter that's up there flying around right now. So um, other things we had to put together before we could start, uh, tools and resources. Some of these we came up with ourselves, like we call them hint cards or prompt cards. If they get stuck, they, they 
click on a digital card and they get a hint of how they can move forward and they can draw as many hint cards as they want to. Um, we gave them avatar makers. You saw when I showed you our team, we, we developed avatars for ourselves. We gave our youth participants participants a chance to be avatars if they wanted to. Uh, we still don't know what some of these people look like. Um, and then we used online free accessible tools like mirror boards, uh, social messaging apps. We put our workspaces in Notion, which is a really nice um, all, all around way to build a project and a lot of different kind of elements for a project. We recorded some specific videos uh, to guide people and we came up with a lot of information and databases and links. So they had plenty of stuff to work with. When they, some people thought we gave them too much, but they had enough stuff to work with as they went through this. And then this is where the four of us stayed during the prototype journeys in mission control. Um, yes, I stole that from a video game, but I dressed it up a little bit to look like Mars. And here we are in mission control, uh, which was really where we did all the overall management. Like if a team had a problem or an envoy had a problem or an advisor needed to talk to us about something, we tried to be available in mission control. Um, all right, then getting to the, the I'm a vegetarian, so I'm not going to say the meat of the thing, of the, the essence of the thing. Um, we ran our first prototype. We put all that stuff together, you know, stories, plans, resources, settlements, maps. And then in early in 2022, um, we launched the project with our first um, group of teams. And it was it was kind of a compressed version. We did it in a shorter time span because we just needed to know if it was going to work. It was going to work as a learning experience and as an edutainment. We hope they would have fun at the same time. So that's what we were trying to figure out. Some of the variables that we wanted to test, um, an age range, we had uh, participants from 11 to 18. Those are their pictures. We gave them the choice of being an avatar or not. So you can see that some chose to be themselves, some chose to be glamorous. They chose to be monstrous. You know, they could choose whatever they wanted to be. But we had a range of age. We had participants from five continents. Uh, we had uh, Brazil, the Philippines, Kenya, UK, and US. So five, five countries, five continents. Uh, we gave people the choice to, they could work entirely online, they could work entirely in person, or they could work both ways, which most teams did. Uh, except for one team that we wanted to test one team that worked entirely online. So we had a global team that worked entirely online. We certainly had varied cultures and economies represented. We had various um, kind of different ways of accessing on online materials. Some people were super wired, you know, they could get on anytime, any, any, anywhere. Some people had to come to a central location to get online. So we tried to work with, we tried to work with the, uh, level of uh, connectivity as an issue. And certainly uh, the relationship between the envoy and the team uh, was very important. We presented this in English, but we were very aware that a lot of our participants did not, their first language was not English. So we tried to be very cognizant of that and provide some workarounds and, and work with that in mind at all times. In the future, we hope we'll get to some translation services so we can make it a little easier for uh, more young people globally. Okay, um, I've had the Model Mars link in the upper right-hand corner. I don't know if you saw it, but it just changed. There's a slash stories after it now, because I'm going to tell you briefly how they dealt with their Model Mars challenges, the stories, the journeys, the artifacts, uh, the reporting out. So if you want to go at any time and read the stories, they're all pretty short, just a couple of pages. You know, I, I encourage you to go there. I'm going to just briefly summarize them uh, on the Shirley Slopes. Um, they, we, we thought of this as our hippie, our hippie settlement. They were kind of freewheeling. They didn't have govern, you know, they didn't have a very established way of governing themselves. Uh, they kind of got what they need or they traded with another settlement. They didn't really have anything, uh, formal in place, but what happened was a visitor from a, another settlement came over from a more, um, established and slightly more rigid in terms of its governance and breaks the rules. And it ends up getting punched out in the cafeteria. So what do you do? You know, we, we called this story law and order because we thought that maybe the journey would end up um, codifying some of the rules and regulations so people would know what's okay and what's not okay. That's not the way it went at all. This team 
decided that um, they made <laughs> they made a, um, a stuffed bunny with sensors embedded in it. And it's because I think in true hippie fashion, they thought the way to solve the problem was that um, why don't we all just get along together, you know? So they invented this, they call it a lifelong companion with embedded technology. It senses the needs of its Martian and provides emotional comfort and support. So that was their, that was their big finish to their idea. And another, another team in the Rexy tube, these are the underground people. They have a very strong economy because they have a factory underground and they make um, major items and sell them for a lot of money. Like they build, they make rovers and other kind of vehicles that they have the resources that they can mine out of Mars to do some of this stuff. And uh, they're making a lot of money and they work really hard, but nobody's having any fun. So how do you solve that problem? Interesting, interesting journey. Um, this was our team from, uh, from Kenya in Nairobi. And what they developed was a futuristic factory. And the bottom level, it was on two levels. The bottom level was still a manufacturing place, but it manufactured more of what they needed, not the other settlements. So they decided they wanted better clothing. So they manufactured, you know, wouldn't you feel better if you had a nice Martian outfit to wear? So that was, that was their thinking. But then the upper level, uh, which they, they burst through the top of the tube. So the upper level is actually above ground. And in it, they, they built a, a, a hydroponic farm and grew all the food they needed. So if you had good food and good outfits, you know, you're going to be happy on Mars, right? So the other interesting thing about we thought about this journey, and I'm not sure how cognizant they were of it, but when they burst through the lava tube, they got natural light for the first time. You know, so light, you know, how we, how we react to light and artificial light versus natural light can make a big difference. So we, we thought that was a really good, a really good thing that they did with their, with their two level factory. Uh, in the Elon's Enclave, this is kind of our artsy community. And, um, uh, it actually the characters some of the characters are they're part of a teenage rock band and uh there's a big mars festival because arts and culture are really important in this community and their performance of one of their original songs just made it to the festival and they're so excited but then a member of the group comes in and says i discovered the mars sound and what she's done is she's figured out how to record natural sounds on mars which is challenging the acoustics are way different you know thin atmosphere etc uh, but she had managed to uh, record some natural mars sounds and mix them in with, with their music so that it made a very unique um, kind of sound and but the problem was they if they went and just kind of gave this away uh, the the current agreement was that all the proceeds from the Mars festival would go back to Earth because the Earth had kind of got it started. You know, they still had connections with Earth. So how did they do this? Well, the group then decides that they're going to build a new experience around the Mars sound. They're going to market it as interplanetarily uh, so that if you live on, on the Earth or on Moon or any place else besides Mars, you can subscribe to this. And they, they rework the agreement. Uh, so that all the proceeds come back to Mars and pay for pay the artist, pay for the festival, pay for the arts education, which is really important there. So Mars Sound, they built an online place where you can access the Mars Sound, and uh, that's what they did. Finally, uh, this is our team that lives on the Ong Flats. Spaceship sex, we knew that would happen, right? Um, leads to the birth of the first child. In, a, in an adults only community. This is a group of people that, that agreed beforehand they would come to Mars and live in an adults only community, which means no children. And it's, it's rigidly uh, regulated. They only create enough resources for the hundred people that are there. Nobody else can move in unless somebody moves away. We kind of thought of this as our fascist settlement. They're a little bit fascist. They're very, very strict and rigid. But when the child comes along, they have to figure out what to do. Uh, her mother dies. Uh, they are trying to decide if they need to ship her off to some other settlement. She doesn't want to leave. Uh, what to do? We thought maybe this would get into um, some issues of youth rights, like a youth bill of rights, what, and or the whole idea of them rethinking whether young people could be a part of this um, adults-only settlement. 
Um, but what our team, this team was from the Philippines, uh, what they came up with was something called remembrance vessels, which is a weird little journey that ended up here um, because the story actually starts after the mother has died and they hand the young woman, or the, no, young person, we're keeping all this neutral, neuter, neutral, gender neutral. Yes, we're keeping it gender neutral. They handed her a box with all her mother's stuff in it. And she decides, you know, well, once, once, now my mom is gone, once I'm gone, who, if you don't have children to remember you, who's going to remember you? You know, so she put, she developed, designed this very beautiful vessel, put her mother's stuff in it. It has some advanced technology built into it. Like um, one of the things in the um, vessel is uh, the, her mother's recipe for lasagna because she was the, the settlement nutritionist slash um, meal person anyway um so when you when you touch an, a sensor on the outside of the uh, member the memory vessel and it has her mother's lasagna in it you get to smell her lasagna so it's multi-sensory you know so you actually can kind of almost recreate the essence of this person even though they're gone well she so impressed the people that she lived with all the adults that were trying to get rid of her that they actually decided well everybody should have a remembrance vessel and that way you know we can die but we, we're still here and so in exchange i think the way it finally ended up the young woman agreed to go live in another settlement until she was adult but then she would be invited back and everybody would have a remembrance vessel so that that was kind of the most convoluted journey but um that's where it ended up we finished our prototype at the end of april and we all got together and that was actually not an easy thing to do given all the time zones um, our Filipino students agreed to get up in the middle of the night. <laughs> That's the only way we could make it work. But they all came, every team, every envoy, uh, all of our advisors came. Uh, we were able to uh, invite astronaut Soyeon Yi. She's Korea's only astronaut to date. Um, she lives in Seattle now, but uh, there she is floating on the ISS. And she came and made a really, really inspiring talk to all the young people. And then we had also Mark West from the United Nations, UNESCO. He came, he made a little talk. They all uh, talked about their experiences. They, they unveiled their artifacts uh, and told us about the artifacts and why they came up with these ideas. And then we had a place uh, to put them because all along the way, as the teams were going on their journeys, we had yet another team based in London um a specialized team to actually develop uh, an exhibition space and an archive depository uh where uh journey materials could be kept so it's it the, the, they came up with something they called the mars planetary museum i've put the link in the upper uh, right hand corner mars museum online and uh, you can go and read more about the museum and see some of the plans but the idea is that everything created on mars uh, get saved um, and shared. And so the whole thing, you know, turns into kind of a, a meta narrative of the experience of humans on Mars and a continuous telling of the story of humans on Mars. That's what we hope to accomplish. We learned a few things from this. Let me see how we're doing with time. We're doing pretty good. Uh, well, it works. Everybody did it. Everybody created a great artifact um, to represent their experiences. Uh, they loved the role playing. Uh, they got right into the characters. And when they met together, either online or in person, for most of that time, they stayed in character. So the role playing really works. There's a list of some of the kind of roles they had. Um, but they, they did that very well. Um, I think this was a given, but we weren't really sure. But solving problems on one world uh, create solutions for other worlds. In fact, we found out we couldn't, you couldn't, it has to be that way because the whole time they were working on their challenges, you know, they were thinking about they live on earth. So we have the, some of the same challenges on earth. So they were connecting things back uh, even before we thought they would and solving problems on earth, you know, like um, anger and, and division. Uh, let's have a cuddly animal, you know, so they, they figured out how to do things like that. One of the big challenges we found was that futuristic thinking is really hard. Uh, you know, what will life be like in 50 years? Will we have currency? Will we have websites? Will we have, you know, a lot of things to think about. But having them actually try to create this in a hands-on kind of way 
um, made a big difference. And finally, we think that our youth participants gained agency. They really got into the, the process. They took on the challenges. I said more agency because I think they youth have agency already. But um, you know, some of the quotes were like, I felt like everything is possible. Another one said, Model Mars changed my life. Wow, you can't get a better endorsement than that. So we're going into the future here with more Model Mars. I'm gonna tell you that just as I close, you know, how, how you can be involved if you would like to, but we're gonna expand more new material, new partners, new settlements. We've got, you know, there's all of Mars to uh, develop and discover. Uh, adding more Mars Earth connections. Uh, again, the challenges that work on Mars also have application on Earth. More crosstalk. We want our teams to talk to each other more, help each other. Um, and also, we want to hear from professionals. We, we want to give them more uh, uh, contact with people who, who can inspire and, and, and help them. We have a place called the Mars Common that we haven't developed yet. So we're hoping to develop that. It's a shared space. If you know what, you know the common as a noun, as a verb, it's like, you know, how do we share the space? How does we make this space work for the benefit of all? So on the Mars Common will be the Mars Fest, the big cultural festival, will be future iterations of the Mars Museum and the Mars Transit Hub. Here's, we're just thinking broadly about the museum that maybe it'll be built Every time, kind of like the um, the Burning Man Festival, you know, when it's time to put it together, you put it together and then you figure out what to do with it afterwards. The transit hub, which is really important. We've got to figure out how people get, all, get around on the planet by ground, by air, how they get back and forth to the planet. And we thought, well, there's someone here that might really be able to help us with this. And so we've decided unanimously to name the um, transit hub, the Robert Zubrin Mars Port. Is he here? Is Robert here? Well, damn it, should I take it away? No, I can. All right. <laughs> no, you can, he can keep it. No, we, we, really, we really want to honor Robert for his contributions. And I found the quote that I really like because it's, it's about how we all collaborate to make happen what we want to make happen. And hopefully that will be space exploration. Um, we're preparing future Martians now, and we're hoping to really democrat democratize the space experience for people. We're growing the Model Mars community. Once someone is a part of our group, they stay involved. Like a, the, the teams want to do more journeys or more different kind of research. The envoys want to do another team. Um, and finally, just ending with, uh, if you're interested, and I hope you are, some of you, uh, there are a lot of different ways you can get involved. If you have an idea for a story, let me know. Uh, if you have an idea for a settlement or where it should be, let me know. Um, if you have expertise in any space-related area, which I know most of you do, we're looking for people to record little short videos uh, that we'll, we'll offer to our, our teams and our community. So if you have um, partnerships you want to explore, uh, any way you have, you can think of, if you just want to get her together and think futuristically with some of us, let us know because you are absolutely all invited. And I will say one more time, Marston. Thank you. I have a few stickers left. So if you didn't get a sticker, you can grab one on the way out. I think there might be a few questions. Thank you very much. Um, so I was really attracted by the Mars Fest and the new sound of Mars. Um, I am a concert cellist from Los Angeles, and I'm also a metadata and blockchain expert. And uh, the discussion around um, the music contracts being based on Earth is exceptionally germane because they are really problematic, how to monetize and how to compensate uh, musicians and artists. Um, legally, it's a it's kind of a minefield now, especially with streaming services. So I'm wondering if that team uh, considered um, a, a new Mars business model, a Mars-based 
uh, contract or even a Martian currency mm -hmm. that could be uh, traded and used on the planet. Um, I'm wondering how far they went with that. And I'm also thinking of a Martian business model uh, that is applicable to the other teams. Could you speak to that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, I, I actually think they were on their way to something like that. They didn't they didn't quite get there. But the idea that if you have something of worth and we in our story, everything Martian is popular on Earth, they more the better. So it does mean that we need to envision a new uh, kind of business policy. And I don't know if you heard Leonard Lopin's uh, presentation yesterday about Mars bitcoins and all of that stuff mars coins and anyway we're gonna keep we're gonna incorporate leonard into our next iteration so he's gonna help us right all right hello i was just wondering uh have you ever considered starting a colony at least on the mars uh model mars in uh on the poles i'm wondering <laughs> where that would go well you know it's all there to develop and uh, if you want to develop a polar uh, settlement, let's talk. Thank you. Good morning. Next up, we have Dr. Greg Autry. He will be speaking on Artemis and the Moon and Destination Mars. Welcome, Dr. Autry. Thank you. We're good to go with the technology. This should work too. Yep. Yeah. I don't spoil my slides. Okay. All right. Welcome all. Uh, first of all, I can't say uh, how pleased I am uh, to be here. I, I could not uh, say enough about that. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Zubrin and everybody at the Mars Society for an incredible work in putting this together. I'm really proud that uh, I was kind of the initiator of bringing this uh, convention here to uh, ASU. Uh, some of you might know that I hosted. Uh, the Mars Society a few years ago at USC when I taught there. Um, and I am just uh, so excited to be doing that again. Um, this morning's lineup, incredible. Uh, honored to be on the uh, the podium here uh, with the people that are uh, that are going to follow me. Standing in front of the podium, the camera's right there. Ah, okay. Hi, audience. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about mentioning the people that are gonna be here later is, is that uh, space policy is generally nonpartisan, right? Um, this is a photo uh, from a few months ago in my classroom, right? And you've got, if you know who these people are, a Dr. Scott Pace, who's basically the, the top Trump's policymaker in space, uh, with uh, General Charlie Bolden, uh, who was President Obama's uh, NASA administrator, basically the top space person in that administration. Uh, and you know what? They like each other, right? And, and they spent... Uh, about two hours riffing in my classroom with my students. So if you guys want to be uh, future space leaders and have the best network ever, I suggest you sign up for my program. But the point is that um, this is not like other governmental domains. Uh, a couple months ago at the uh, first Artemis launch attempt, I hosted a uh, panel of the Thunderbird School of Global Management, ASU did at Kennedy Space Center. And again, you see a bipartisan uh, group there. You've got myself and General Bolden again, uh, Jim Bridenstine, uh, Trump's NASA administrator, and Bahavi Alal, uh, who we'll be hearing from shortly, who led the uh, Biden uh, transition team for, uh, for NASA and other agencies, and who is uh, an amazing uh, expert on nuclear propulsion and power and uh, the acting chief technologist at NASA, Mike Gold. Uh, Gabe Sherman and, and Scott's up on the screen again, right? But what really impressed me is look at the end of this, right? Could you imagine any other of 
agency in the United States government where you would have the Trump, Obama, and, and Biden team up smiling together like that and hugging each other, it would not happen. So I'd like you to give yourself a round of applause for being part of the space community, the most functional part of the United States. <laughs> All right. Okay. We may agree about it, disagree about a lot of other things, and I can be brutal on Twitter about economic policy or social issues, but when it comes to, to space, uh, you know, we're all moving forward together. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out that I'm particularly uh, pleased with the current administration's effort was the uh, intent to uh, ban anti-satellite weapon tests that are that are destructive. This is something that makes total sense. We're not giving up anything here, folks, because we wouldn't do this anyway. We're not going to go up and create a mess. This does not prevent the United States from developing technologies and testing things non-destructively, but we're not going to go make a, a mess on orbit again. Uh, and by taking the moral high ground, we've encouraged other countries to follow suit. Uh, and uh, uh, President, Vice President Harris's announcement has been followed by announcements from the UK and South Korea. Eventually, we'll get China and Russia on board, hopefully, with, with good behavior in space, because we've got to have that if we want to go forward. Um, now, back to Mars. I had a long, long list of the best ways to get to Mars. Well, actually, that's it, okay? Okay. Uh, if you if all you really want to do is just get people on Mars uh, and you're not dealing with a bunch of other issues, this is how you do it. And, and, and Bob has nailed it and he's been talking about it for years. And I completely agree with him that other methods may be less efficient to achieve this goal. That said, if you were at USC uh, a few years ago, how many people were there at that event? Okay, I, I had the joy of debating Bob Zubrin, which, you know, he has no filter and he's brilliant. And uh, it's, uh, it's you know, a challenge in front of his people, right? And, and I supported the, the Lunar Gateway, which he despises. Uh, but but let's talk about how things actually work and, and why the, they are the way that they are. First of all, you can only do things that are technically possible, okay? Engineering matters. The laws of physics are not exactly flexible. Uh, and so if you have ideas that don't comport with, uh, with engineering possibilities or the laws of physics as we understand them, they're probably not going to happen. Uh, I, I do get countless emails from people that want to talk to me about their perpetual motion machines and their anti-gravity systems and their uh, reactionless uh, thrusters and all that. Uh, keep sending them, you know, I, I hope someday you're right. But uh, things also, though, have to be economically possible. If there isn't enough money in the world to pay for it, we can't do it. So terraforming Mars, probably not happening anytime soon because of, of this issue. We're going to have to find some, some new ways to think about that. Uh, I do think it will happen, uh, not in my lifetime. They've got to be politically possible, okay? So you can't do things that... Uh, that irritate your government or sometimes the governments of other countries. And there are a lot of things we'd like to do that fall in that domain. But what you end up with is this little nexus in this Venn diagram. This is things that are actually the realm of possible space policies and plans. And a lot of us have ideas that fall into the, the outside categories. We've got to deal with, as Jim Bell said yesterday, uh, the mission that we have. So in my opinion, this will never happen. The big government flags and footprint program to the moon that looks a lot like Apollo on steroids. Sadly, no, uh, it won't get funded. The Artemis program to the moon, the GAO now estimates it, I think $93 billion, but let's just say $100 billion. And we all know it's going to cost more than that, right? Uh, Luckily, I'm not actually the CFO of NASA right now. I was nominated to do that. If I was, I wouldn't be able to tell you uh, that that's not <laughs> you know, the way things work. Um, the, the ARIES program uh, from the Martian, and I've talked to a lot of people who know, who, who won't be quoted, but $200 billion to $400 billion. That money is not coming out of the United States' uh, budget. We've got to find another way to, to do this, okay? Uh, we had this thing called Journey to Mars at NASA, right? The, the squid chart. Uh, and it was just a graphic. Nobody was developing a lander or an ascent vehicle uh, to implement that program. Nobody really believed it was ever going to happen. We just talked about it because they darn well knew that Congress wouldn't pay for it, right? So they worked on other things, and they're good people, and they worked on other things that were good, frankly. 
uh, but they had to keep talking about it uh, to keep the public happy. Now it should happen because the public wants it as we've discussed, but we're constrained by the NASA allocation of $25 billion. It's less than one half of 1% uh, of the federal budget uh, in 1991 when uh, George Bush Sr. left office, it was about 1%. And as we know, during the Apollo program, it was as much as 5%, but that is never ever happening again because of the unconstrained growth of entitlement programs like Medicare eating up the federal budget. It's just the reality. The DOD space budget, uh, I'm not allowed to tell you what it is, I'll have to kill you, uh, but you know. Um, the F-35 cost overrun, to put this in context, and I'm not talking about the airplanes, I'm talking about the, the overrun, the part that they, they didn't know about or lied about or something, $180 billion, okay? So that is like seven times the NASA budget, right? And it's, it's five times uh, everything that we spend in space. Medicare fraud, waste, and abuse. This is not uh, providing medicine to keep uh, old people uh, spry and golfing forever, right? Or driving the RVs around the desert. This is the money that's being stolen, $80 billion. The money the government knows is being stolen. Who knows how much is really being stolen? But this is three times bigger than the NASA budget, right? And growing. Okay, this is where your tax dollars are going to go, like it or not. We do get benefits from space. I need you to talk about this whenever you get a chance to speak to a public representative or the media or anybody who cares. One of my favorite examples is the savings from global positioning system, according to a Motorola study for just the US trucking fleet. Nothing but the trucking fleet, $52 billion a year. Our entire space budget is basically returned to us in the improvements and efficiencies in our trucking fleet, okay? Not to mention Uber and, and Pokemon Go. Is that still a thing? <laughs> okay. If NASA canceled the SOS Orion uh, program, the agency would have plenty of money to do Mars Direct with Starship. Who believes that? Raise your hand. Is that true? Okay. So who says that's false? The rest of you are bloody cowards. Okay. Um, I know this is a popular sentiment uh, uh, here sometimes, uh, but let's talk again about how things actually work. So Congress decides how NASA gets to spend its money and they appropriate money that the OMB uh, apportions to the agency. So Congress says, we want you to do this. You will build this heavy lift rocket. You will do it at this center because uh, there are jobs in state X uh, and you will do these science experiments because there are jobs in state Y and everybody kind of wrangles over this in a dark room and, and we get the, the NASA budget. Now, I want to be clear, these are mostly good people who are passionate, care about the future of America and about our space program, but they're also elected by people in their state to go do things that those people want to have happen, and they do a good job, and I don't blame them for doing that. Now, OMB, on the other hand, decides whether NASA is really, really, really going to get the money to do what it is that Congress told them to do, and unfortunately, in space, OMB tends to act as though they're policymakers, not just a, an oversight organization. This is the Office of Management and Budget. Now at the agency, you've got the office of the CFO and you've got the administrators and they can allocate these monies to the various programs in keeping with the laws that Congress uh, drafted, which if you really wanna go to sleep someday, I suggest you go look at some of these NASA budgets and, uh, and appropriations. But let's just say, that Senator Administrator Nelson decided that he wanted to uh, to move money from one program to another. Uh, we would call that a, a programmatic transfer. No problem. Well, it is a problem that NASA is not run like some other business where the CEO of the business just goes tells the, the CFO that we're gonna move money to one program to another. No, 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 no. Congress has built in something called a not to exceed limitation into all of the funding. And guess how much money the not to exceed limitation is in most cases for NASA? Anybody know? Close to that. It's in the hundreds of thousands, like 500,000 is the number I often, often see in these bills. Yeah, hundreds of thousands. You cannot buy a friggin' condo in Washington, D.C. for the amount of money that Administrator Nelson is allowed to actually make decisions on. So no, you may not go cancel the James Webb taste telescope because it cost a bunch of money and just go stick that into uh, uh, Mars sample return or something you love can't be done. 
okay? So we have to live in the real world. Now, in the real world, we can't afford to get Congress to give us $400 billion to go to Mars. So I would suggest we apply the 80-20 rule. And 20% of the, the money uh, for uh, the Aries Mars mission is sending Mark Watney to Mars. 80% is the bringing him home part. So my opinion is don't bring him home, okay? Uh, we are perfectly capable of putting something the size of a minivan on, on Mars, which means we can put an astronaut or two and uh, enough uh, material to keep them alive for long enough to determine if there's life on Mars, you know, a few months, and, uh, and then we're done, okay? Um, Congress is not going to prove that, but the day they do, I'll sign up, okay? I'm just curious how many of you would sign up? All right, yeah, so they, there's no problem getting qualified people to do that mission. Good luck selling it. Uh, but the other op opportunity is focusing on uh, creating a permanent settlement rather than building the crazy Mars descent vehicle and getting it to work, right? And I know that if you're a theoretical armchair engineer that, you know, building the Mars descent vehicle and giving, oh, I'm just gonna use in resource utilization and make some methane and pump it. No, you've got to make the methane. You've got to do that with an automated system that you can't touch when it breaks down. You've got to compress this stuff, which takes a bunch of energy, keep it uh, cryogenic and load it into this rocket. We can't even get the SLS off the ground because we have leaks in the fueling system all the time. How are we gonna do that? millions of miles away where we can't touch them. This is hard, okay? This is really hard. So I say skip the ascent vehicle. Uh, now, where does the money uh, in space come from? It's really important to see that 60% of it is the United States government. I think Jim Bell mentioned yesterday, the US government spends more money on space than everybody else combined. And I'm happy we do. It has paid massive dividends to us. The reason you're sitting here, uh, with lots of cool technology has to do with uh, externalities generated by this investment over the last 70 years, right? I wouldn't have solar panels on my roof and the two electric cars being charged and all these cool things if we didn't do this, okay? Now, you might think the Russians are number two. Nope, 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 nope. They're actually pretty irrelevant and shrinking. Look at that, 2.7%. Uh, in fact, the Japanese spend more than they do. The Europeans spend a lot more than they do. The Chinese are moving up. Now, is that concerning and, and frightening that the Chinese are moving up? Well, we'll have to think about that. In my opinion, first of all, competition is good and cooperation is boring, okay? So in 1957, the Soviets did this and oh my God, the Soviets have launched an artificial moon and they're gonna drop nukes on us and they're gonna spy on us and uh, panic, panic in the streets, good. 13 years later, I mean, Look at that stupid steel ball. And 13 years later, we still have this iconic photo, which most people think looks high tech today, right? On the other hand, we decided to get together in 1974. We had Apollo Soyuz. We did the famous handshake in space, Kumbaya, right? And I know there's a lot of people who think that if uh, we did a United Nations space program and everybody worked together on just one program, it would be far more efficient. Well, how does working together work? 25 years later, we had something that looked a lot like that, okay? And it still had a damn Soyuz attached to it, right? 22 years later, we got a bigger thing that looks kind of like that in the same orbit, right? Same altitude, same inclination. And it has a Soyuz attached to it, right? Okay, finally, we're moving beyond the Soyuz, I think. But the fact of the matter is, I love ISS. We, we've done a lot of amazing things there, but we haven't done anything bold and amazing because there wasn't any conflict. Conflict is good when we don't actually shoot at each other. World War II gave us amazing things. I would never recommend a World War II, but you know, you got jet travel, you got nuclear power, you got microwave ovens, uh, I could go on. Uh, a competitive space program is a beautiful thing. So bless the Chinese, okay? Um, and I completely, absolutely agree with the uh, Senator Administrator Nelson on this topic, that the Chinese are predatory uh, when it comes to territory. You look what they're doing. Uh, you know, on the earth and, and just figure out how that's going to work on the moon. And it isn't good. We need to be serious about this. And I am so glad that we are and that that is also bipartisan. Now, the thing I love the most, though, okay, and this is how we get to Mars, is look at the private investment. Ignore 2022. That that was just the first quarter on this chart, so that, that's not the whole year. Uh, but we're up about $50 billion a year now in, in private investment into space, which is pretty much the same as the U.S. government investment into space. That is a beautiful thing, and that is what we need to leverage. And so we need to do it in a way that makes sense. And unfortunately, going and building a Mars program today, unless uh, 
you're Elon Musk and just personally passionate about it is not a business model. So how do we get to a business model? Well, you look at some of these companies that are that are raising funds and they realize, yes, someday they want to go to Mars and 3D print a rocket. Uh, bless Tim and Jordan. They were students uh, that I am proud to have worked with at USC uh, since uh, since the beginning. But they also realize that they've got to do things one step at a time and they've got to have customers for their rocket for, for Leo work and they want to go to the moon because they know that that's achievable in a reasonable amount of time. Now, Leo commercialization is totally real and this this brought it home to me. I, you know, I've always been talking about it for 20 years, but I was literally flying on an airplane from Miami uh, to uh, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina uh, and uh, I looked out the window as we passed over KSC at about 22 miles away, just uh, outside the limit uh, for a, a launch day, actually. And I was looking for the SLS out on the pad at, at 39B, and you could actually see the VAB and the path out to the pad here, and I could see the SLS. This is an iPhone photo, mind you, right? Uh, but there's that little squiggle at the top. What is that? I honestly saw the Axiom 1 launch just happen out the window of my plane as I'm driving by, and there's a human commercial space launch going on as I happen to fly by. I took this photo again with my iPhone, phone right and i looked over at my neighbor in the plane seat i go say hey there's my my friend mike going to space <laughs> how cool is that right <laughs> not only do i see this commercial rocket going to space i, I know the people on it right amazing a uh, cis lunar commercial is actually emerging and there are things that we can do there that will return value to earth in a reasonable period of time they can close a business case for private investment so that's happening nasa is supporting that i think that what uh, smd did uh, uh under thomas Zubrek and with uh, the clips program supporting artemis is a super good example of getting the robots and people working together on the same mission so in my opinion nasa's moon to mars makes sense uh, one thing I want them to do, though, is clarify their position on the moon. It's got to be permanent and sustainable. I'm so excited that I was part of the team that sat down and looked at NASA's capabilities and said, what do we do with these rockets and capsules and stuff? You know, let's go to the moon. It's something we needed to, to do again, and we need to do it right this time, which means permanent and sustainable. And we decided we were going to send a woman to the moon, which, of course, is why it got named... Uh, Artemis, and that's great. And the Biden administration's expanded that to include a person of color. We need everybody on board in space if we want support. So that's all good. But let's not send a woman and a person of color to just do something some white guys did 70 years ago or 50 years ago. Let's give them something important to actually do historically, which is establish the permanent and sustainable presence on another world that gives us the capabilities to learn the things we need to learn in order to do Mars right. This includes developing better uh, environmental control and life support systems, better spacesuits, figuring out the food and consumables when we're only three days or a week away from uh, more food and consumables rather than, than doing it when we're months or years away. In situ resource utilization, it's not exactly the same on the moon but there are, uh, as it is on Mars, but there are a whole lot of parallels and we're going to learn a lot there. Radiation, we don't know really how the human body reacts to long-term exposure outside the Van Allen boats. We can get this done and we can get it done in the next few years. Partial gravity, we got a ton of data on 1G, right? You know, you're all, you're all data, right? Uh, we've got a really good amount of data on 0G from those years and years in, in LEO on the station, but we don't know anything about in between. Hopefully finding out what 1-6 gravity does to your body and to the gestation of organisms. Let's take, let me recommend this to NASA. Bahavi, this is really important. Kittens. I want to send kittens to the moon, send a pregnant cat. Let's see how that gestation, if you have kitten videos on the moon, the NASA budget will be no problem, okay? <laughs> But we need we need to know, right? Okay, we're going to do long distance operations at again a relatively safe rate and cryogenic refueling. Okay, people don't talk about this. I love the Starship uh, idea, and I'm glad that uh, that we're including it as uh, one of the vehicles for the human lander system. I strongly believe we need, need to have two because if we're going to send people who are not test pilots uh, to the moon, we need to be able to get them back. These are like regular human beings, scientists, artists, engineers. Uh, they need more than one way to come back. So it's good. But Starship has to be refueled on orbit 10 to 12 times before it can go and land on the moon. Okay. We've never refueled anything cryogenically on orbit. 
this is a big task. I think SpaceX is going to have some cryo refueling blooper reels, right? Um, that we're going to learn this, and this is important. And NASA is helping fund it with uh, with Artemis program. So important. Um, I also want to talk about internationalism and, and program continuity. Yeah, the Kumbaya thing doesn't produce disruptive innovation and fast change, but it does often secure uh, the success of something. And one of the reasons ISS has never been canceled by a uh, change in Congress or uh, presidential administrations is because we don't want to piss off our, our European partners on this program or previously the Russians. The Russians have pissed us off now, so, you know. Uh, that's how that goes. Now, Gateway, same thing. Bob hates it, but it's an amazing opportunity for us to develop a lot of capabilities that we need to do in space and do it internationally and make sure that we bring our, our partners on board and they stick, right? Uh, now, of course, one of those partners is probably going away. Uh, now, I hope we see regime change in Moscow and, and they come back because I love the things Russians have done historically. I carry around a phone case with a picture of Yuri Gagarin on the back, uh, an oil painting I actually own. And, and so I'm really respectful of their heritage. But uh, right now, I don't think it makes sense uh, to, to plan on them being a dependable partner. So what do we do? Well, there's some other countries coming forward. I'd love to see ISRO get on board here, right? Uh, I was speaking in India a year ago, and I'm going back in, in, in January. And, you know, they had a real close relationship with the Russians. I'm like, you know, it's time to move on. You need to join Artemis Accords, right? So 22 nations have joined the Artemis Accords. Something I'm really excited to, to see that started in the last administration has been aggressively carried forward by the current administration. Uh, I'm hoping you're going to see this country pop up next. Anybody know who that is? That's Ecuador. If that happens, I want you to know it's uh, because of a student of mine at Thunderbird, who uh, Robert Aon, who has uh, took me down to uh, Quito to meet with a bunch of government representatives and got Mike Gold talking to uh, the Ecuadorian ambassador to the U.S. and they're excited about it. So look for that. Uh, and like I said, uh, if you want to ever be part of the best and only accredited master's uh, degree in space management, uh, we would love to sign you up. Uh, we've got a table right out there. My colleague, Katie, Katie would be glad to help you. Uh, if I have a moment for questions, I will. You can find me on Twitter at uh, Greg W. Autry. And I, I warn you, I can be kind of like Bob Zubrin, uh, unfiltered. Hi, thank you so much. It was great, great talk. Um, I'm personally interested in like the legislative and policy side yeah. of space. What advice would you give to someone who's looking to make that a career? Yeah, uh, well, thank you, first of all, for doing it. Um, I would join my program, uh, but no. Um, obviously, keep in touch and read all about it. And don't just read the news headlines. Dig in and read the actual uh, uh, laws that uh, that are passed, the bills that are proposed and don't pass. Uh, and go spend some time in, in D.C. Walk the halls of Congress. The way I actually got involved in this is I just cared about this issue, right? And I started researching it as a management scholar, academic, back in 2002. And by 2004, I began to see we needed to uh, enable commercial space in several ways. So I paid for my own dime to fly to D.C. and I would walk around the hallways of Longworth and Rayburn and knock on the doors. And a couple people answered the doors and brought me in. I became good friends, for instance, with Senator, I'm sorry, Congressman Dana Rohrabacher, who was on the SciTech committee and worked with him and Tony DeTora, his uh, legislative assistant. And, and actually, you know, they listened to my advice. Some of that went into things like Commercial Space Launch uh, Act amendments. Uh, I spoke to uh, people that I didn't agree or didn't agree with me as well, uh, but I began to understand why they were doing what they were doing and uh, so important. So, so engage and, and, and they're surprisingly open. Uh, and, you know, if you go ask for a meeting with a staffer uh, that does uh, space policy, they'll probably actually come talk, uh, talk to you uh, and you should do that. And if you can't do it in person, uh, you know, try to do it remotely. Yes, sir. Or, I, I'm sorry, she's in charge of the microphone. Hello, uh, just quick. Quickly, um, any thoughts about, uh, you know, the, the government did support a good bit of, you know, early aviation stuff. And, yeah. and Bob Zubrin mentioned that, you know, the possibility of maybe doing point to point rocket stuff. And I was wondering if that was a way maybe to expand congressional support for space. So. Yes, please. So one of the uh, roles I had until recently was I served on the Comstack Commercial Space Transportation Advisory Committee for FAA as an appointment from the Department of Transportation. And I was the chair of the Safety Working Group. We help advise FAA on potential future rulemaking uh, and on, uh, you know, how to promote and uh, 
uh, facilitate the industry, which is also part of their mandate. Uh, and we should work on that, promote and facilitate. I'm going to tell you, I am concerned, and I have said so publicly, that FAA's current direction is all about regulation and safety, bless their heart because they are putting people who are in charge of airplanes into the space office, which before was all space people. Uh, I actually interviewed for the top job uh, at AST uh, a couple of years ago. Um, I didn't get it, but I can tell you that the, the committee of people that I went to go interview at FAA, there was nobody who knew anything about space on that committee and they didn't care. All they wanted to talk about was the national airspace and how to keep rockets from interfering with it. We need to change that attitude. We need to own point to point travel. And if the FAA wants to stay relevant in the future, that's where it's at. We need to set standards that come from the United States the same way that the United States set the standards for air traffic management globally. You know, if a Russian pilot lands in Shenzhen, uh, he talks talks to the Chinese in English, right? And uses terminology that we put together. We want to be in that same position. All right, thank you. I'm glad to talk to anybody offline. You have an amazing group of people coming up. The microphone. Okay, next we have former NASA chief scientist, Dr. Jim Green, and you, <laughs> welcome Dr. Green. Thank you very much. While we're getting ready for the slides, let me mention that 35 years ago, we started a whole series of analyses from, um, codes that we took from Venus and how Venus changes in a runaway greenhouse to the Earth. And we modeled what happens at Earth if we add a little CO2. And 35 years ago, that was the start of how we now understand about climate change. What's happening on Mars today is we're now in the realm of the supercomputers to really delve in and understand its atmosphere through global, developing global circulation models, through developing new concepts of how to tweak the environment and what changes that produces. And there's nothing like having human presence on Mars. As you know, humans are terraforming the heck out of this planet. And so there's processes that will begin as humans begin to uh, live and work on uh, the red planet. Well, we know an enormous, okay, let me just go to the next slide. None of these are working. <clears throat> this for a good slide. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with this slide, but um, okay, great. So what have we learned about Mars? I wanna talk about uh, before we can really talk about what, it, what kind of changes will occur when humans show up on the red planet, we really got to understand what the baseline is. Well, over the space program, we've learned an enormous amount about how Mars has changed over time. So early on, three billion years ago, Mars was a blue planet. It went through rapid climate change, about two and a half billion years, and it now is the arid and, and very cold uh, planet we see today. Um, we have a lot of ground truth, we call it, with a lot of our missions. Uh, this is a Mercator projection of Mars, which the blue areas are the lowlands, the high areas are the reds and the whites. The green areas are the ancient shoreline of Mars. So when we go and look for life or signs of life, these are where you'll see many of our missions. The Phoenix mission, however, in the high altitude, latitudes rather, uh, dug into the dirt looking for uh, where water might reside on the planet. And it found it just below the surface. The concept is some sort of water layer then would be, as you go towards the equator, deeper into the planet. Okay, deeper into the planet. We now know the crust of Mars doesn't produce plate tectonics. So it is what we call a stagnant lid. And Mars, we're finding out with insight, is actually quite hot on the inside. 
so that means it has uh, uh, magma, it has uh, volatiles, uh, it's being trapped by this stagnant lid, and there's a water layer there. So there's a significant amount of water in the crust of Mars. The solar winds stripped a lot of the atmosphere and a lot of the water away from Mars, but indeed we believe there's a frost layer uh, well into the soils. And of course, uh, we're, we're tasting that uh, with, uh, with curiosity. The atmosphere, of course, is dominated by CO2, but there are trace gases. Nitrogen is very important. Uh, oxygen, argon, and uh, carbon monoxide. Uh, the temperature variation is enormous. 170 degrees Fahrenheit variation in one day. And indeed, this is what has locked in a lot of that water in the crust of Mars. Pressure-wise, uh, here's uh, two seasonal looks at how the pressure changes on Mars, one during the summer, one during the winter. And what we see is um, uh, everyday solar heating heats up the ground and a pressure wave of CO2 uh, goes through uh, the planet. Particularly during Northern Hemisphere winter, as the sublimation of the CO2 in the Southern Hemisphere uh, occurs, there's no polar cap then, and that CO2 ends up into the atmosphere. The key diagram here is on the right. This is a phase diagram for water. You can see where Earth is, where you have a pressure and temperature, and, and that whole, the, that whole um, um, triangle that says liquid, this is where water would exist on the surface. And of course, it exists on the surface of of Earth, but as you can see, Mars is virtually at the triple point. We've got to raise the pressure, we've got to raise the temperature to get it to the point where liquid water can be maintained on its surface. Once we start doing that, then a whole series of other changes can take place. Well, if this is the current status of Mars, how did it get that way? Well, Mars lost its magnetic field. It had one, a significant one, uh, probably uh, at least three and a half, maybe four billion years ago. And so the solar wind has been stripping the atmosphere of Mars. And MAVEN has been measuring an average of 1.3 kilograms per second is being stripped. Now, conceptually, today, Mars, his atmosphere is in equilibrium with the solar wind. That means what it strips is being outgassed, and that's how come we have an average of about seven millibar per, uh, per year of, of pressure on Mars. Conceptually, if we can stop the stripping, Mars will then increase in pressure, and the increase in pressure will mean an increase in temperature. Unfortunately, many heliophysicists believe that Mars's low pressure is really due to stripping from extreme solar wind events. So these are huge coronal mass ejections that hammer the planet, ripping huge pieces of the atmosphere away. And we're now realizing that the sun does this. Uh, here on Earth, uh, the first really big event we call the Carrington event here on Earth. It happened in 1859, uh, where Aurora, this was such a huge event, the Aurora is an indication of how the Earth's magnetosphere is rearranging and protecting itself against the solar wind, goes through Canada, through the United States, through uh, Mexico, through Central America, and if you were in Colombia and looked up, you would see an aurora. That's right. This was an enormous event. It produces currents in the ionosphere, which then disrupt electrical equipment on the ground. This is why we are very concerned about our power grids, how they can be affected by these solar superstorms. So what we've done is, what does the solar superstorm look like on Mars? So once again, we'd go in our supercomputers. 
we really do the analysis. So the pre-storm events, you can see is a very uh, low current that's generated. Uh, Mars in itself is the red circle. So instead of the ground being a sink of current, the ground becomes a, a source of current. Uh, and it's an induced current that comes from huge currents that arise in the ionosphere. And the peak storm event is shown on the right-hand side, which is twice a Carrington event. So we must be able to learn, if we're gonna live and work on this planet, that we'll have superstorms sometime in its future, and we have to be able to fend against it and come up with a strategy. So not only are electrical equip equipment susceptible, but also the atmospheric pressure as it begins to strip the atmosphere away. Well, we all know that Mars's atmosphere is thin, therefore cosmic rays uh, have an opportunity to make it uh, to the surface. And as you can see in this particular diagram, altitude versus energy de deposited by uh, a whole series of energies of cosmic rays. Mars's pressure is such that we have many significant high energy particles making it to the surface. So a thicker atmosphere would help. That would then lower that curve, uh, just like it is done here in the, in, in, um, uh, in, on Earth, but also a magnetic field would also enhance that activity in terms of lowering this ionizing radiation, making it to the surface. So let me mention now, that is the baseline of what we know. Now let's go back into supercomputers and figure out what can we do uh, to be able to mitigate a number of these problems. And let's start with the human exploration zone. Unlike the movie The Martian, where uh, NASA established a number of bases every time it went there, uh, the current plan is that we will go live and work in one area called the exploration zone for all our missions into the foreseeable future. So this exploration zone is about 200 uh, kilometers in diameter. We land in one area, we live in one area, and we also want to use the resources that are there through ISRU activities. We want this area to be scientifically rich. And so uh, there's been a fair amount of discussion as to where this area might be on Mars. We've already had a workshop and have identified about 45 different sites. And over the next couple of years, we'll have another workshop and narrow that down even further. So conceptually, how do we protect this first Fourier to Mars, uh, for which we wanna be on the planet for long periods of time. Some believe forever. If you land, you stay, right? So um, uh, one of the ideas, of course, is let's protect it with a magnetic field. The first concept we investigated, once again, in supercomputers, this is where we're at right now, is generating a magnetic field at Mars L1. This is the Lagrangian point. Lagrangian points are very specific areas in space for which it is always in front of you and the sun and orbits with you. It's a very unusual spot and it's due to gravitational pulls and tugs by the sun and the earth canceling out, allowing you to then follow the earth. So what kind of field do we need that would mitigate uh, a, a number of these things because the magnetosphere can generate a huge magnetic field at this location. We can actually situate Mars, in the magneto tail of this huge current system. Well, how do we generate a magnetosphere? Well, here on Earth, you know, we basically have what we call the, the base field is called a dipole. This is um, uh, like a bar magnet on the left where the magnetic field or, uh, originates in the interior and then the field moves out in these large circles. But in a similar way, you can create through a current loop, a dipole-like magnetic field. 
And so uh, there's actually some work being done on generating large magnetic fields. Uh, Rutherford Appleton Laboratory, uh, they're building tokamaks and they need confinement. They use very large magnetic fields. And so conceptually, uh, they are using these kind of currents, these current loops to generate a dipole-like magnetic field. And to generate something about the Earth's intensity of the Earth's magnetic field, you need a total power of about 65 gigawatts. There's also work being done with plasma terminals where you can create, once again, a current loop and then the plasma is moved from one terminal to another, accelerated as you go along, generating a large magnetic field. And uh, this requires uh, fusion reactors to be able to generate the power necessary to do these. Okay, so let's say we can generate fields, maybe as large as these, well into the future. How would we apply them in this particular case? Well, the first example I mentioned would be um, uh, generating a dipole-like field through these current systems at Mars L1. And this is a full-blown three-dimensional MHD simulation that shows that we have Mars in the center of the magneto tail. And here's the solar wind being diverted around, uh, which, um, uh, contributes, of course, to the interaction with the with the with Mars without a magnetic field, and 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 uh, produces uh, the stripping. Uh, the pressure is also an incredibly important element of this, and you can see Mars is really well protected, not completely protected, but relatively well protected. So these hybrid simulations show that the stripping. Uh, is stopped by about two orders of magnitude. Now, this is really quite exciting. It has a number of advantages. And as I mentioned, if you stop the stripping, the outgassing is gonna continue. And as the outgassing continues, the pressure goes up and the temperature goes up because of that relationship. And you establish a new equilibrium. It's the beginning of Mars terraforming itself, if you will, literally changing globally the environment. Now, uh, probably the best set of simulations we've done since the previous one requires a huge magnetic field to be able to produce this on the order of the size of the Earth's magnetic field. Okay, so 65 gigawatts of power will have to be generated in that environment. But can we come closer? Can we produce another magnetosphere that has the same effects closer to Mars that has more benefits. And it turns out we can. And what we do is we create four current loops at aereo stationary orbit at four locations around the planet. And when we do the computer analysis of this, we see the noon midnight projection on the left. You can see the, the two currents in this plane, one on the night side, one on the day side. You see how Mars is bathed in those magnetic fields and therefore well protected, uh, not only from the solar wind, which comes from the left, uh, hitting, hitting this, mag uh, this, this artificial magnetosphere, but literally, in this case, nearly prevents the stripping. It's now three or four orders of magnitude less stripping that goes on in this particular case. And this is with all the currents in the current loops moving in the right, the same direction. And the right-hand rule tells us those are north, north pole uh, current systems. If we look down on this system, in other words, cut it in the equatorial plane, we see how these four current systems uh, literally bathe the surface of Mars, okay? So we stopped the stripping. Uh, also, uh, this is, we believe, the best protection against a solar superstorm from stripping the atmosphere. And then, of course, you have 
the, the larger magnetic field intensity helping you reduce the cosmic radiation that gets to the surface. Now here's another example where we've changed the direction of one of the dipoles such that it's a southward seeking one. And that's the one on the left, sorry, the one on the right. The one on the left has both the current systems moving in the same direction. And we call those uh, north, uh, north pole systems, dipole aligned systems. And the one on the right has a north and a south pole. <coughs> the one on the right uh, literally stops the, uh, the stripping. Now, Mars's atmosphere, just like the Earth's, is going to heat up based on solar radiation. And as soon as it heats up uh, with solar radiation, what happens is the ionosphere expands into space. And when it does here at Earth, it's trapped on our magnetic field lines. And we call that region around the Earth where the ionosphere is literally evaporated into space, but trapped the plasma sphere. And in both of these cases, we have a trapped plasma sphere where material moves down into these field lines and then is trapped. Now, what that means is as soon as these field lines fill up with ionospheric plasma, they stop the evaporation. Yeah, thank you. I pulled a muscle in my back yesterday and it uh, doesn't help me. Sorry. Thank you very much. So this helps maintain as much of the atmosphere as you possibly can while Mars continues to outgas. Once again, the interior of Mars is hot. Insights even found that the core has an outer layer of molten, uh, uh, will be iron and nickel, although it's not generating a magnetic field, that's typically where it does. This means that, that Mars itself has a huge potential to continue to outgas. Now, what would it be outgassing? Well, the primary outgas is CO2, but if you heat Mars up, you'll get more of the water that's trapped in the crust. And water, is, uh, water vapor is an even bigger uh, CO, uh, greenhouse gas than CO2 is. We also know that Mars leaks methane. We don't know the origin of methane. It might've been old methane that's trapped below the ice layer. We see from curiosity, that is that crust heats up uh, and, the, and, and uh, becomes more porous. Methane appears to leak through the surface. And so consequently, we might also see, in addition to CO2, in addition to water vapor, more methane. Well, methane is also an enormous uh, greenhouse gas. In fact, the ordering is water vapor, methane, CO2. This also will, we believe, continue the process of letting Mars heat up. Add more material into space uh, in the atmosphere, you then also increase the temperature. Now, these magnetic fields can be mapped down to the surface. And when we do that, Here's where all northern magnetic fields map to the surface. And of course, because they're at area synchronous to orbit, they move uh, with Mars um, uh, on a daily basis. So you place one of these directly over the exploration zone, where you maximize the amount of magnetic energy to the surface, protecting that environment, uh, protecting it from uh, by lowering the cosmic ray input, uh, by stopping the stripping um, uh, as, uh, as the solar wind comes by. And you end up with a surface magnetic field that looks like this. Now, if you can imagine being in the center of this diagram uh, at zero degrees longitude, zero degrees latitude, and you had, a, you had a compass, as you traveled in that environment, you literally can geolocate yourself because you now have, you know north, you know south, based on the intensity of the field going down, you then can, can, can figure out which latitude you're going to. And so it also adds 
uh, the, the possibilities for locating yourself on the surface. Once again, you can also change how these fields arrange based on their current systems. And here you see uh, uh, the, the central location has little magnetic field, whereas the other two areas are really intense. And so consequently, once we learn how these four dipole systems are managing the solar wind, we can change their current direction, which changes the current field, which is a dipole-like field, and literally changes that surface magnetic field that provides or aids in protecting uh, the exploration zone. So here's another example where we've had uh, two of them are going north and two of them are going south. <clears throat> okay, so in conclusion, let me mention these kind of concepts, much like the climate change concepts that emerged 35 years ago, are in the realm of the supercomputers right now. This is what we have to do to understand what effects happen based on our knowledge of the, of the environment and our knowledge of Mars and how to protect human assets and their equipment and their infrastructure on the planet Mars. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, uh, I've done some uh, back of envelope calculation and you mentioned that we are stripping the atmosphere at a rate uh, 0 0.1 kilogram per second. Yeah, in, low speed solar wind. Right. That means at one year we are stripping 3 million kilograms. And that means that in one year, if we block the stripping completely, we would increase the atmosphere by about one tenth of a, um, one tenth of a billion billionth. Uh, basically, the atmosphere of Mars uh, is three times 10 to the 16, and we are increasing the the atmosphere by 10 to the power of six, right, a year, which means that assuming linear progression, which would not happen, but assuming it, uh, in 10 billion years, we would double con uh, concentration of the gases in the atmosphere. So the question for you, if we prevented the stripping of the atmosphere completely, how long would it take to increase the atmospheric pressure by 1%? Yeah, it takes a long time. And, so that's and, uh, yeah, second, yeah, that's second point. correct. That's second correct. point, uh, if you prevent uh, the stripping, you also prevent the accumulation of the solar wind hydrogen, which is arriving. And to point out uh, how weak effect this is, Venus, which is much closer than Mars to the sun, uh, does not have a magnetic, uh, atom, uh, magnetic field right. at all as well. And as you know, uh, it has much thicker atmosphere and the stripping is in equilibrium with the amount of hydrogen brought right. and stripped is uh, in equilibrium. Yeah, so, so Venus's atmosphere is getting stripped enormously. The difference is Venus is generating a lot of it through its volcanic activity. Oh, how long does it take uh, to, uh, uh, if that was the only process, uh, it does take, it does take um, thousands of years. Yeah, thousands of years. But that's not the only reason why we do that. Yeah, Steve. What we teach our students, which does not necessarily mean we teach it correctly, is that the <clears throat> reason why the atmosphere is at the triple point is because it's regulated by the alkaline basalt, which is exposed over Mars. So if you raise the atmospheric pressure more, you would get more rain, which would then erode more basalt, which would put more alkali into the into play, which would absorb more carbon dioxide so that the pressure would go back down which means it would rain less, which means you, and then you would restore carbon dioxide from an outgassing. Is, is that wrong? No, you're right, you're right. Um, uh, what we've started to do is use um, uh, supercomputers for looking at through the Mars uh, Climate Modeling Center, the MCMC, uh, what, what happens as we change pressure and temperature. There's a variation across the globe. What happens is the temperature increases at the equator, but decreases over the pole. So um, uh, 
the atmospheric interaction you're talking about, we haven't completely feathered out what would happen in that area, but we have started that process. I didn't show any of the results of that. Okay. Oh, uh, I'm Dr. John Brandenburg from Kepler Aerospace, and I'm a plasma physicist, so I've enjoyed your talk very much. Um, just wanted to um, ask if the stripping models for Mars are exactly what they say, why wouldn't Venus be a barren planet like the moon? Because it's much closer to the sun and has no magnetosphere. You've partially spoken to that, but could you expand on that, please? Yeah, Venus is much larger. It maintains a huge gravity, holds more of the atmosphere, and is far more uh, active in uh, uh, volcanic systems over its lifetime. Uh, in addition to that, some of the more recent modeling seems to indicate Venus was also a blue planet, and this runaway greenhouse effect really only took over in the last 800 million years. So unlike Mars, it has a very different evolutionary track. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. You're very welcome. Thank you. It's going to just get to Good morning. I am very happy to present Dr. Bahavia Law. 
Admin Associate Administrator at NASA, and she will be discussing nuclear propulsion for Mars. Welcome, Dr. Law. Okay. Good morning. It's an honor to be here. Uh, I'm here this morning uh, to talk about uh, nuclear propulsion uh, to Mars, and um, I'll try to speak for about 20-ish minutes, and hopefully we'll have a time. We'll have some time for a good discussion. Um, I'll talk about uh, five things: what are nuclear propulsion systems, just for us to all level set. Why would we want nuclear systems to get to Mars? What's the plan? What are we thinking about? What are we currently doing at NASA? And what challenges do we want to, do we need to overcome? So again, level setting, you all know what nuclear propulsion systems are, but uh, there's two variations. Nuclear thermal uh, propulsion systems are very much like chemical systems, except we have now separated the, the propellant from the heat source. So, you know, nuclear reactor heats up let's say propellant like hydrogen, it exits out the back at very high velocities as a result. And, and since hydrogen has such a small molecular weight, weight it, it, it's able to, um, you know, the rocket equation will tell you that it provides a very high ISP, twice as, as much uh, in specific impulse, uh, twice as much as chemical systems. And that's a good thing. And we'll talk about why. Uh, and, and EP, nuclear electric propulsion systems, are, are a little bit different. In fact, they're very similar to reactors on Earth, where you use a nuclear reactor to generate electricity, and then uh, elect electricity is used to, to, to accelerate charged particles, you know, uh, an atom like xenon, uh, uh, again, out the back of the, of the engine, uh, creating very high levels of um, uh, a, a specific impulse. So, and TP offers impulse levels, as I said, of twice as much as chemical systems. And with an EP, you can get uh, a specific impulse that's five to 10 times that of um, chemical systems. Of course, the difference is that with NTP, um, you, you get very high levels of thrust, similar to chemical systems with NEP, at least for the moment, thrust levels tend to be lower, although there is no physical reason why it cannot be higher. If you have very high power reactors, you can have you know, similar levels of thrust. So there's no physical limitation to, or physics limitation to getting high thrust out of NEP systems. Um, um, I actually uh, took this picture, which is on the right side, when I was visiting Marshall many, many years ago. Um, and it, it was kind of a reminder for me that uh, nuclear isn't a new thing. When President Kennedy talked about, um, you know, went to Congress to ask for funding for Apollo, he actually specifically asked for funding for nuclear propulsion rocket and NTP system. And, and what I find interesting on, the, on, the, on this poster, uh, which I took a picture myself, is, you know, number one, you know, taking a man to the moon and bringing him safely back to Earth, accomplished. Number two, <laughs> it's still overdue. And then, of course, number three and four were other things that we also got done. So it's something we started thinking about right at the dawn of the space age. We just haven't close the loop. Um, so I guess the question to ask is, well, why do we want nuclear systems to get to Mars? And I said a little bit earlier, um, it's the specific impulse. There's really nothing magical here. Nuclear propulsion gives us better gas mileage. So um, uh, the higher ex exhaust velocity of the propellant in NTP systems uh, will allow for much less use of propellant, which of course is a good thing because one, it reduces the cost of uh, launching all that propellant. And even if launch costs are going down as they are, there is still a huge amount of logistical integration that needs to happen if we have large amounts of uh, chemical propellant that needs to be going up. So it is, uh, and because of the high thrust that NTP systems allow, you are able to transport humans, which is actually important because uh, when we are in, um, in the high radiation environment or zero G or other factors of space, we want to get to places fast. And of course, um, depending on how you pick some orbits and actually uh, Pam Meldroy, who goes after me, is going to talk a little bit about how we're gonna to get to Mars. There are some high energy orbits you can use um, because you have nuclear propulsion systems that will allow you to get, um, get to Mars and back faster. Uh, similarly, as I said, for NEP systems, the higher ISP allows you to, um, again, have much, much, much better gas mileage, but because of current systems having 
lower thrust levels, uh, it, it it will not be very fast, at least for the moment. And so NEP systems would be really great when we want to take cargo where we can be slower, but we can take a lot more for much less uh, amounts of propellant use. So ultimately, nuclear what nuclear gives you is better gas mileage. You know, you have a Prius and, and you can do so much more with it. So um, can we go to Mars with chemical propulsion? Of course, we can, you know. We, you know, if you want to go, go cross country, horses are just fine. But, you know, it's nice to have airplanes. You know, we can do so much more and have so many more opportunities, which is essentially what nuclear propulsion does for Mars as well. You know, we, we, want, we don't want just to go to Mars, right? Nuclear is a capability. It's a national capability that allows us to do so much more, so much more than just going to Mars. It allows us to go to, you know, interstellar places, right? So, um, and as, and as, as I said earlier, even if launch were free, chemical systems have challenges. And it's just something, it's a, it's a national capability we need to invest in, almost independent of, of the need to go to Mars, although obviously it is very core to our getting to Mars. So what is our plan currently? Um, for the moment, we have not made a decision how we will use nuclear to get to Mars. And there are lots of trade studies underway. So we are looking at chemical, we are looking at solar, electric, uh, and chemical hybrid systems. We are obviously looking at NTP and NEP uh, combined as a hybrid with chemical, because as I said earlier, with current power levels of NEP systems, the thrust levels would be too low. Um, so from a mission pool perspective, we are still figuring it out. Uh, from a tech push perspective, NASA is actually wanting to invest both in nuclear electric and nuclear thermal propulsion systems. And just recently, the National Academies wrote a report in which they gave a similar recommendation that we do not know enough to know whether, which of the two systems are the ones we want to be using to go to Mars. So we need to invest in both to be able to make that down select a few years from now. Uh, we would like to, and again, I'll talk a little bit more about this in later slides. There are other parts of the government that are developing NTP systems. We want to collaborate with them. Uh, we want to make concurrent investments in nuclear electric propulsion systems. We do want to continue to support chemical systems, obviously. Um, and uh, we also want to be investing in next generation systems, whether it's nuclear fusion or, or it's uh, what are called liquid core nuclear thermal propulsion systems where the where it's no longer a solid fuel it's you know it's 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 liquid that allows for much higher levels of isp and other advantages so that's kind of what we want to do uh, what are we currently doing um, and uh, we are primarily investing in nuclear thermal propulsion today we want to be making um, um, you know multi 100 megawatt and i think I'm, uh, we're looking at about 500 megawatt thermal systems uh, using uh, what is called high assay, low enriched uranium reactor. And um, high assay, low enriched uranium, as many of you may know, is about, uh, is uranium enriched to around 20% enrichment. In the old days, we used what, what is called um, um, weapons grade enriched uranium. And I think in, in, uh, in, in, in 2020, uh, there was a presidential memorandum. And I think earlier there was a question around policy issues, and I'm really excited about that because I'm going to get into some of those policy issues. So there was a policy decision that was made that unless there is a good reason to, we want to be using uh, low enriched uranium or you know, high assay low enriched uranium uh, for our system. So that's what we're working on. Uh, and that's where there's a lot of new data that's needed because all of our previous data, you know, from the rover days, from the days when we did invest in, in NTP in the 1960s and 70s, we had been using highly enriched uranium. So that data doesn't fully translate. And a lot of experiments that we had done before need to be re recreated. Um, NTP requires very high temperatures, uh, you know, 2,900 Kelvin, 3,000 Kelvin. We do not have, we do not know, we don't, those materials don't yet exist. There's a lot of research that needs to happen to, to make sure that uh, we, we develop those materials. Uh, there's a lot more we need to do in terms of manufacturing systems that can handle that kind of flow rate, that kind of temperature that an NTP system entails. Um, we need to be doing some subsystem design uh, and, and, and building to just understand how some of these things work. Uh, we need to be doing some ground testing and actually that's pretty complicated because 
um, again, in the old days, uh, we did a lot of these testing outside, you know, in, you know, with all of the exhaust going into the air. We, we don't do that anymore. So we need to think about how we might do ground testing. And there's some really interesting emerging ideas on can we just test some of these things in space, never doing a ground test. Again, a lot of debate in the community as to how we might do that, but a but lot of really interesting new innovative ideas as well. And then, of course, since uh, for NTP, we are currently thinking of uh, hydrogen. And as you know, well, hydrogen is a tough uh, element to deal with in the cold of space. So there's a lot of cryogenic fuel uh, management research and investing that NASA is doing. On the NEP front, I don't want to spend a whole li uh, lot on this, mostly because as per Congress, NASA should be investing mostly in NTP. So for NEP, we've done some very low level experimental work um, in, uh, either in-house in or with universities. So a lot more needs to be done. In fact, the National Academies report I had, I had referenced earlier uh, had made the point that if you want to be going to Mars with NTP systems, it's feasible in the 2030s with, uh, with aggressive investment, but with NEP, our investment levels in the past have been low enough that even with aggressive investment, we are not going to make um, a, a, a mission to Mars in the 2030s. So um, it's, we just need to do a lot more with NEP then, so, so as to, to make sure that we have enough information about both NEP and NTP systems to, to make a down select. Uh, so what have we what have we done in in recent months uh, for for NASA is actually not just investing in in propulsion systems we are also investing in surface power we are looking at having a reactor on the moon uh, for example for you know heating or providing electricity to human habitats for um, um, ISRU in situ resource utilization all sorts of I mean you need power right and. And so we are working on, on developing power systems for, for the moon. Of course, they translate to uh, Mars as well. Obviously, Mars is a different environment. It's, it's a CO2 rich environment, not like the moon, um, but there's a lot of parallels. And, and those are some of the things that we are, we are going to be looking at. So we have, um, 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 uh, there, there has been some work done at the White House on how we might provide launch approval uh, for nuclear systems. So NASA has revised our internal safety protocols to accommodate this, this uh, policy called the NSPM 20. Uh, we have developed, working together with other government agencies, DARPA in particular, uh, we have developed technology roadmaps for fission systems. Uh, and actually, we just recently re completed a report on how we would use uh, propulsion and power systems through 2040. And all of these reports are available if you would like to see on our various websites. And if you don't find them, let me know and I'll make sure you can get them. For surface power, as I mentioned, we are looking at a 40 kilowatt electric system. Uh, again, low and rich uranium. Um, we are you know, looking at different aspects of the reactor, moderator materials, uh, and we have um, completed work with industry in recent months to develop better designs. And our plan is to go to the next round of, of solicitations to industry uh, to, to begin to uh, do the next level of, of work. On uh, thermal propulsion systems, again, we have selected and awarded phase one awards to industry for designs. Uh, we have been uh, working with the Department of Energy to fabricate and test um, some you know, specific kind of fuels. As I mentioned, uh, the fuel for nuclear thermal propulsion systems has to be able to withstand very high uh, temperatures. So we need to develop some of these, um, the fuel, um, field forms. Um, we work very closely with Idaho National Lab uh, to do some of this work. And uh, we have been working with DOE and uh, industry in, develop in completing preliminary feasibility studies. On NEP, as I said, not a whole lot going on other than uh, thinking through some uh, technology maturation plans. Uh, I mentioned uh, our collaboration with other government agencies. Uh, DARPA is an important collaborator. DARPA is thinking about um, developing an NTP system for fast maneuverability in cislunar space. Obviously, they are looking for different applications than NASA is, but there's lots of common areas of interest. They are looking at a lower ISP system than NASA would like. So, um, so in other words, you know, they, they, their fuel doesn't have to go to temperatures as high as the fuel that NASA would like. But nonetheless, there's lots of really important areas of, of collaboration. We had a a memorandum of understanding that we had signed with them uh, last year, which is being up, 
updated to include some new new thoughts and new ideas on, on potential collaborations. Um, the Air Force Research Lab is looking at nuclear electric uh, systems. As I said earlier, NEP systems are important for NASA. They are really helpful if you want to go deeper into space for robotic science missions where speed isn't as important. Um, and you know, luckily, NEP has its uh, AFRL uh, has interest, and it would we we are looking at potential collaborations on NEP with uh, with a, with uh, AFRL uh, colleagues. Um, again, within DoD, there is a strategic capabilities office goal. They are developing a small modular reactor for forward bases. And again, as you can imagine, for NASA, lightweight small reactors are very important. And again, you know, terrestrial reactors are different than space reactors. However, there is a lot of common commonality that we need to leverage. For example, fuel forms might be useful for us to commonly develop. Um, last but not least, uh, and in fact, one of our most important collaborators is the Department of Energy. Uh, DOE has, has labs. They have decades of experience developing nuclear systems. They are, they, they are actually looking at some really interesting new ideas like 3D printing nuclear reactors, which is just you know transformational. Again, it's a little bit out in the future. Uh, I see Jim smiling. I don't know if he's excited smiling or if he's... <laughs> Uh, so, so there's a lot of really important collaboration that we are doing across the board with government agencies. And, and as I said, we think of nuclear as a national capability, and it behooves us to work on it together, not just with other government agencies, but also with the private sector, and we have been doing that. So what else is going on? And here I come up with, with some of the policy issues that I think had come up earlier. Um, actually, before I even say that, I'm just so excited to report that uh, in the 23 budget, for the first time in many, many, many years, the president's budget included funding for uh, nuclear propulsion. Um, in, in previous years, it had been. <laughs> and, and this is thanks to all the effort that our administrator, Nelson, and our deputy administrator, uh, Melroy, uh, made in terms of helping um, the White House understand the important, the, the relevance of this you know capability for the nation um so so again uh, other policy on uh, policy front i mentioned nspm 20 this is a presidential memorandum on launch of spacecraft containing space nuclear systems um there was actually a a, a policy in place before but it applied primarily to a radioisotope a thermoelectric systems rtgs and we weren't really sure how they would apply to fission systems. So the policy was updated to include fission systems. And also what was what's really interesting about the policy is that it quantifies launch risk based on the characteristics of the system, level of potential hazard, and national security considerations. So it's a tier system, which really makes it um, makes it um, possible for us to have different levels of approval for whether you have a little tiny Rue, a radioactive, radioactive radioisotope heating unit, um, which is only a few grams of plutonium to you know, a nuclear reactor with many hundreds of uh, kilograms of, of uranium. So, so it really does give a path forward. And you know, um, we always, whenever, whenever we talk about innovation, we're always talking about technology innovation, but I believe that NSPM 20 is actually a policy innovation because of this, document there's a lot more industry interest in developing nuclear fission systems because now they see a path forward now they think they can be involved in developing technology and ideas another uh, part where we've had policy guidance for nuclear is the 2020 national space policy which says the united states shall develop and use space nuclear power systems where such systems safely enable or significantly enhance space exploration or operational capabilities. Again, um, you know, these are very, you know, almost boiler boilerplate words, but they are very important because they give us, a, you know, they give us top cover. They give us a, a sense of direction. Another uh, uh, piece of uh, guidance that came from the White House was uh, uh, what was called Space Policy Directive Six, SPD Six, which is a national strategy for space nuclear power and propulsion. Um, uh, it lays out a, a strategy for the responsible and, and effective use of uh, SNPP systems, and it specifically actually points to highly enriched uranium systems. And he said, and it, it doesn't ban them; it doesn't require that we use high assay LEU systems. 
systems. It just says the use of highly enriched uranium in SNPP systems should be limited to applications for which the mission would not be viable with other nuclear fuels or non-nuclear power sources. So they give us the alternative to use HEU if we need to. Uh, they just have, a, there is just a sense that it may be easier for us to work with nuclear systems. For example, we can involve more of industry and have more international collaborations if we are using low enriched uranium systems. So that's not all. There was also an executive order on small modular reactors in 2021. And uh, this particular executive order uh, talked about uh, uh, government agencies, including NASA, defining requirements for utilization of nuclear energy systems for human and robotic mission through 2040. And it also said there is a, uh, there is a need for to, to develop a common technology roadmap through 2040. So lots of White House policy guidance. We have had incredible uh, legislative support for, for years. There's an annual $110 million appropriation from NTP for NTP. And there are uh, frequent congressional hearings where Congress wants to know, you know what it is that NASA is doing. And the 2022 Authorization Act includes specifically includes a section on nuclear power and propulsion. Internationally also, there is a lot of uh, guidance. Uh, you know, UN Resolution 4768 lays out principles relevant to the use of nuclear power sources in outer space. And there's some, there's some weirdness in it, but you know, we can talk about another point. The weirdness is that, that it says that we shall we can only use HEU in, in uh, nuclear systems. I think there's some, you know, I, I have some ideas on why it's why it says that, but uh, these are solvable problems. So there's lots of policy guidance, there is funding. I mean, obviously there could be more funding. So what are some of these challenges that we need to overcome? Um, and again, just to make the point that, you know, over the years, we have, it, I said, this is not new. Over the years, we have spent, depending on who you ask, about $20 billion on developing propulsion systems and propulsion and power systems. However, we keep starting and stopping. And I think that's, that's our challenge. Um, my view on, on, on the challenge is that it's a chicken and egg system. Our human exploration uh, folks, have not yet said, hey, we would need a nuclear propulsion system that has an ISP of X and a thrust of Y and a time frame of Z. And because there is no mission pull, we have not had as much technology investment. And of course, the, the egg portion is that because there's no technology investment, there's no, the, you know, mission planners are afraid to ask for specific systems. So I think we need to break the cycle. That, in my mind, is the biggest impediment to developing a propulsion system. I think we are there. I think with the president making a request, with Congress being supportive, with all of this policy guidance, I think we are starting to break that logjam and moving forward. Um, there are some other impediments as well, but I think they're all solvable. There are some disagreements about whether we want to move forward with NTP or NEP systems. Again, both have uh, both have good uh, good uh, you know pros and cons, and we need to work through those. Um, again, up until recently, there were some you know there were policy uh, impediments, but we, as I said, we are trying we, you know we are getting over those. And again, up until recently, there was not as much commercial involvement. And again, having commercial involvement makes things so much more exciting and interesting. And there's you know new funding that you know that government doesn't need to uh, uh, you know government can 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 have help. And again, I do want to make the point on the right that actually the use of nuclear power is not settled. There is legitimate competition from chemical and chemical solar alternatives. So we really do need to look at all of these opportunities in the same in the same frame. Um, uh, there is no silver bullet. We need to do a lot of things at the same time. We need to make the case. We need to tell why is nuclear enabling. I think I started to do a little bit of that, but we need to do a lot more of that. We need to have our decisions made by strategic factors, not just technical ones. Uh, we need to kind of start small. I think we always try to go to the you know the best and the the, the best system ever. We need to kind of start with something smaller, do demos, collaborate more with others and see where we get. Um, we need to start to test an emerging regulatory regime. Um, we need to be a little bit tra more transparent about our budgets and, and acknowledge that it is very difficult to, to, to predict budgets for systems which we have never built before. Uh, we need to learn lessons from other domains. The RTG world uh, is a really important uh, way for us to uh, think about how we might develop vision systems. Um, we shouldn't overpromise. That's a recipe for cancellation. And there are some remaining policy issues as well. For example, you know, how do we think about operation operations issues? How do we 
think about decommissioning because the policy guidance we have is mostly on um, on launch. Um, let's not forget to address public perception issues. Nuclear does have that. Uh, with that, I will end my uh, talk and I'm happy to take any questions. We have time for one quick question. Hi. Actually, I have two. I don't know if you have time to answer, but one is I understand in the 70s or so that uh, this program was stopped because of public protests and concerns about a launch failure. And, and how are you going to address that? I know you briefly briefly did, but uh, the second is I understand from Dr. Zubrin that the reason we don't have fusion energy at this point is more of a policy issue than a technical one. And I wondered if you agreed in that. Thank you. Sorry, what was the first question? What or was that? As I, as I understand it, in the 70s or so, this program was derailed because of public protests, concerns over a launch uh, explosion and spreading nuclear material. How are you going to uh, get around that issue? It seems clear to me that we're not going very far from Earth and we're going to solve climate change anytime soon without the use of nuclear power. Thank you. So actually, uh, NSPM 20 actually does does precisely that. It lays out what are some of the 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 maximum um, levels of performance for for the rockets, the maximum levels of radioactivity that can be disseminated. So so it lays out what the process should be. It's very logical. It's very um, it's 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 risk based. Having said that. Public perception is never really driven by good, te good technology or you know logical thinking, and I think that was my my one of my points, right? I think we need to address public perception in ways other than you know better technical systems, and and there's a whole literature on how you do that, and I think we need to learn from that. On your second question around fusion, um, I guess I would love to talk more with Dr. Zubrin and see how he thinks it's a policy issue. It may be a policy issue in that we are not investing enough, but Best I can tell, we haven't, um, you know, we have to produce more power than we put in, and we haven't been able to do that. Uh, and again, maybe it's a policy issue in that if we put more money, it would we would have better results. So, um, yeah, look forward to that discussion. Oh, yeah. Okay, I am very pleased to welcome Pam Melroy, NASA Deputy Administrator. She will be talking about Mars Future, the human machine teaming path to get us to Mars. Welcome, Pam Melroy. Thank you. Thank you. I am really excited to be here. And I just want to thank all of you um, because I'm a dreamer too. So we dreamers, we like to get stuff done too as well. And uh, I just like to talk about some of my favorite aspects. I'll talk a little bit about um, our moon to Mars objectives and our strategy for how we're going to try to get to Mars. But then I want to drill down in a little bit and talk about something that I think is really exciting, which is human machine teaming. We do have a lot of challenges ahead of us uh, to get to Mars. And I'm personally excited. I feel like we are on a path. We, very importantly, we have a transportation system that is gonna get us to deep space uh, between the rocket and the Orion spacecraft that's capable of uh, protecting a human and bringing a human back uh, at the much higher Mach numbers than we have from low earth orbit. Um, so this is a, a great time as we prepare uh, to try again on November 14th to launch Artemis One. Um, we know we're going to get that rocket off, and we know we're going to learn a lot on the first mission. We have hardware in, in place uh, and in development for the first four missions, and a few pieces going on the fifth mission as well. 
So uh, those are all test flights for us to understand the hardware and uh, start to get a sense of the operations. But it's really important that we talk about what we are doing and how what we are doing is going to get us to Mars, which is the goal. I just want to make a comment, which is that I was very inspired by the Apollo program. Uh, my you know, father uh, recorded on a, the audio from the television on a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, got us all us kids out uh, in the middle of the night to watch and listen uh, on the television, and I was done. At that point, I knew I wanted to go to space. And so what I'm excited about is now that we are actually getting ready to go back to the moon and out into deep space, this is inspiration for a whole tidal wave of engineers, scientists, aviators, and explorers, and it's the uh, Artemis generation. So it must be my physics background, uh, but I always like to start with first principles. So this is actually one of the most important charts. I show it almost every time I speak, and it is why do we go to space? What are the benefits to humanity? That's really important to NASA because we're a government organization, which means we are here to serve the people. That is our responsibility. Now, there are three pillars that I've put up here, science, national posture, and inspiration. Science, of course, learning about the universe, learning about ourselves, learning about our climate. National posture is leadership in science and technology, uh, understanding and partnering in a positive way around the world. Those international relationships are very important because they help us set norms of behavior, which are the things that we, we want to do together. And then of course there's inspiration, just human inspiration, but also the inspiration for that next generation. Now, I bet you uh, that you think one of those pillars is the most important. Almost everybody has one that they prefer. But I will tell you that after decades in, uh, in space flight, I know that the entire stakeholder community is interested in at least one of those things. So maybe you're not interested in all of them, but someone is, which means that from my standpoint, our most powerful activities take into account all three of these things, because if we don't take them all into account, there are stakeholders and some of whom fund us who will not be happy because they're not seeing the pillar that they care most about out there. So as we go forward, it's really important to come back to these first principles and make sure that the things that we're doing are addressing this. What's significant about this is that we do have other countries, we have private entities, individuals and companies who all have their own why, but don't forget they have no obligation to benefit all of humanity. They have their own why. This is what sets NASA apart. This is our responsibility is to benefit all of humanity. So this is where we started on our journey to the moon to Mars strategy. We, we set up some guiding principles from the beginning. And that the first one is incredibly important to set up an objective based approach. So uh, I have seen a lot of so-called strategies that look like a very nice list of things to do, but it's really important to set objectives and actually say what, what it is that you're trying to achieve from a goal standpoint and what the objectives are uh, to achieve that. Architect from the right, that gets to setting that big aspirational goal. If you start with your whole strategy for the next five or 10 years is just to go to the moon, that's where you're gonna land and that's where you're gonna stay. And in fact, in my mind, I'll tell you, Mars is not aspirational enough, but I'll get to that in just a moment. So you have to architect with a, a, your aspiration from the right, and then you execute from today to that point. And as we know, we have hardware, we have science, we have things that we've learned, and we have to take all of those into consideration as we move towards that, that goal. Staying with a consistent plan. One of uh, my biggest concerns is uh, that we do have a political system that changes over. And so political resilience is really, really important. This plan has to have that. It has to be something that we can all get behind and that there is stakeholder support. 
but it's not enough to have an awesome plan. We also have to talk about it. We have to consult with all of our stakeholders and we have to communicate, communicate, communicate so that everyone understands what the plan is. They automatically know, especially inside NASA, what's your place in that plan and why are you doing it? And so that's inside and outside. So the aspirational goal is to create a blueprint for sustained human presence and exploration throughout the solar system. So what we're saying here is we are going to go practice on the moon. We're going to go practice on Mars. We have a lot to learn and we know that. Mars is much harder than the moon. We know that too. But really what we're trying to do is figure out how do we repeatedly go to any destination in the solar system? And as Dr. Lal uh, suggested, perhaps beyond at some point. Um, there is an order to these things. There is a sense of what do you have to know first? Uh, how do you optimize around that? In some ways, it's like city planning on steroids, right? You got to have the whole thing figured out. So that's really the, the aspiration and the goal. We. Uh, all took the, a look at that. I asked the senior technical leadership at the agency, uh, all the deputies of our mission directorates, including aeronautics, by the way, because I think they're going to be important in the future. So we see uh, Ingenuity helicopter on Mars. Um, we'll hear more about that in a moment. But I asked them all to get together and create the objectives to create to what do we need to know to get to Mars to demonstrate the ability to have this blueprint, learn from it, tweak it, and, and evolve from that. So the objectives that they came back with fell into four general buckets. The transportation and the habitation ones, everyone's familiar with that. You gotta have transportation, you need a rocket. And uh, for humans, you need something that will protect them in deep space and also get them back to earth. And that's that's fairly straightforward. Uh, we're working in that. We also lump into that suits, uh, transport vehicles, rovers, and such. But science is absolutely central. I go back to the three pillars. Science has to be front and central in everything that we do. That has not always been the case. Sometimes it's been an afterthought. I, of course, was part of the generation that built the International Space Station. We learned that doing science on the space shuttle was tantalizing but we only flew the shuttle five or six times a year for about 10 days to two weeks at a time. So the space station gave us the opportunity to do science 24 seven. So we really need to be thinking that way. How do we maximize the science output? And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Infrastructure is in incredibly important. Maybe it might not be for the moon, which is three days away, but as we go out into the solar system, if we really want to maximize the science that we're doing, we're going to have to stay longer periods of time because the trip is so long. So it's OK for a test flight to have humans land on Mars and spend 30 days for a six month trip there and a six month trip back. It, it's OK for a test flight. But if you look at how we can maximize the science that is not a good ratio long term. We really need to be thinking very effectively about that. And in order to do that, we have to have the infrastructure that supports humans for long time, long durations uh, in deep space. It has the added benefit that infrastructure encourages our commercial partners and industry to follow us. Infrastructure benefits industry and allows them to close their business case addressing that second pillar of national leadership in science and technology. And uh, in addition to that, operations. So this is the one that's probably the least obvious, unless you've been at NASA for the last uh, two decades. The way we operated the space shuttle is very different than the way we operate the space station. And we went, we were on short duration flights that were very intense. They were focused around a specific payload. That is not the way we operate on the International Space Station now. And we're going to have to learn a whole new paradigm doing science in partial gravity on the surface of another planet. We also identified that there are some recurring tenets that all of our objectives have to address. And uh, they include 
uh, items like, uh, let's make sure I've got my list, um, international collaboration, industry collaboration, responsible use and interoperability, all really good things, but it was kind of ridiculous to repeat them for every objective. So we pulled them out into uh, recurring tenants. It's important to know that we did this with consultation. We had a public consultation process, one inside NASA, one with industry, academia, and nonprofits, and another one uh, with our international partners. And this is going to be a continuous process. We think our objectives are pretty good. They're probably going to stay stable until we start learning things from going to the moon. But uh, we will have to always be thinking about them and talking about them. So now that we have a set of objectives, let's ask about architecture development. How does that meet? So I talked about architecting from the right and executing from the left. Well, we're in that messy place right in the middle. We're already executing. We've got a rocket on the pad. We've got to be thinking about all of these things. But one of the interesting aspects of architecture development is that you, where you end depends on what question you answer first and what you optimize around. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Let's start with when we go. Let's say humans to Mars, specific date, or are you gonna index to something else, some other thing happening? Like when we get this capability, we, we should go. Or is it get there and get back within a limited total duration? And that's actually a really important question, and I'll talk about why in a few minutes. So now you have to start asking questions like, uh-oh, um, well, if we have to get there by a certain date, then tech development might be off the table because we don't have time for it. Major systems take years to develop. So maybe we just take what we got and go. And what do you assume about what assets you have that can do that? And if you have that shorter duration, it's really going to drive your architecture selections. And then you have to ask, uh, and uh, what do we do? What, what, what we have time to do when we're there? And this gets a little bit to some of those science questions. If you're going to bolt, pick up rocks and bolt home. Well, that's one approach. It's not the approach we're taking right now on perseverance. We're taking our time and we're picking the optimum samples to bring home. So one option would be to stay in orbit because you simply don't have time to develop a system for a lander. This is where these kinds of questions from the beginning start to drive you if you keep you know, following the thread from wherever you started. And of course, this is going to influence why we go, because if it's all about getting there by a certain date, well, maybe the reason we're going then is to beat some deadline. Or if we have mission pull, we're just trying to drive so that current programs uh, are utilized. And maybe we're just trying to expand our human spaceflight experience. But it will also influence where we go, because we're going to go where we can get to the fastest. And that gets back to orbital instead of landing on the surface. And it also will influence who will go, because the number of crew is going to be based on the time available to develop systems. And you can go faster with fewer crew because you have less of a logistics tail. Let's start with a different question. What if we started with why we go? To demonstrate the capability, uh, to establish a sustained human presence and for specific science objectives. Now you're going to see that the questions you have to answer as you start pulling the thread are different. Are you going to the easiest spot you can get to? Or are you going to the best location to maximize your science? Or where the resources are for sustained presence? What do we need to meet the mission goals? We need camping gear or do we need real infrastructure? And this gets to the science piece. If you're gonna stay and you're gonna maximize, you need to provide the science infrastructure or big infrastructure for a long stay. Who will go? Well, if you're going again to scoop up rocks and bring them home, you may only need two crew, but if you really wanna do science, then you're gonna need the scientific expertise and a larger crew complement to stay. It also drives the round trip time uh, to get to and come back. And the stay duration drives the surface and system support mass. Humans take a staggering amount of logistics. 
We see that every day on the space station, the science and the humans, we're constantly having to send supplies up to the station. And our landed mass begins to drive very big challenges. Like, you know, if you wanna do it super efficiently to land a lot of cargo on the moon or on, the, on Mars, uh, we're going to need some entry, descent, and landing systems that are bigger than the ones that we use. Hence, uh, NASA science, uh, Space Technology Directorate's new lofted experiment, which will be going up in November, to look at extremely large inflatable decelerators uh, as a part of the tech roadmap. And of course, when we can go and return, do we go now with what we have, wait for new technology, or wait until all the elements are developed? So you can see where you enter that circle and the questions you ask lead to a different set of questions and possibly with a different outcome. And one of the great examples of this that I'd like to give, Pavia told you all about nuclear propulsion, so I'm not gonna go through this. She did tell you that we're interested in both thermal and electric. Uh, one of the things she didn't talk about is why is nuclear thermal so great for humans? Well, it's because it's faster, right? That's great, right? That's But what's the inherent assumption? The inherent assumption is how much risk it is to send humans out into space. Humans are very fragile creatures. So we want to go fast to limit that exposure. Well, suppose we burned down all those risks and had people living aboard the space station uh, for three years at a time. Maybe that doesn't matter. Maybe nuclear electric is okay. And oh, by the way, the way nuclear thermal propulsion systems work, you turn it on full and, and get the thrust that you need and start headed towards Mars, and then you turn the system off. And then when you get close, you turn it back on to decelerate five or six months later. So most engineers who are designing for safety and robustness are like, really? You have an engine that you are gonna fire once, turn it off, and then try turning it on again six months later and it's got to work or everybody's gonna die, really? So there are some really big trades that we have to make with these systems. I'll just talk about the science objectives for a moment. This is an eye chart, you can go take a look at them. Uh, what I thought was very exciting about the discussion that we had with our partners was we, we had been initially very focused on our decadal uh, you know, the National Academies does the decadal study, and we were looking at that for heliophysics, uh, for astrophysics, and for, of course, lunar and planetary science. But we reframed them after consultation with industry, academia, and our international partners. We still have lunar and planetary science objectives, but we actually took astrophysics out and made them physics objectives because they're really about the nature of the universe. Obviously, human and biological sciences, lots to study, lots to be ready for before we can go to Mars. What I thought was also very intriguing is they picked two new buckets. One is uh, science enabling, which means it is uh, technologies that uh, and objectives that help us maximize the science we do with humans. So you're going to see in there things like we have to develop a formal training program for astronauts. And that's obvious, right? You know, okay, but why are we doing that? We're doing it because we want to maximize the science. In addition to that, they have an applied physics bucket, which is what is the science we can do to enable everybody else's objectives? And a great example of that is some of the science behind ISRU. So there's some foundational science we still don't have yet. So I thought this was a really interesting outcome. Let's get back to humans for a moment. So now I'm gonna kind of get to the point of the talk. I've been hinting at it all along. Uh, we know that humans are staggeringly difficult to support. We, we also know that there are unknown health risks, uh, serious health risks associated with long duration space flight. We do have a tech roadmap that will help us along the path here. We uh, believe that we can get about 85% of our life support uh, uh, objectives done on the International Space Station before it's decommissioned in 2030. And that's great. Some we are going to have to do in deep space, and we're looking to gateway to help us get to those. And of course, our surface operations as well. But uh, it's, it's, really, it's really interesting when you look at this, 
uh, the transformation that's happened in the science community. First of all, they understand now what the massive value of humans in the loop for science. I'll give you just a couple of examples. Uh, one would be that in the 25 years and the multiple rovers that we have operated on the surface of Mars, we are now just exceeding the total distance traveled on the last four Apollo missions by humans. So their mobility uh, and creativity, um, it, it is a significant boost to the amount of science that you can do. The power and the mobility that supports human beings can do a lot of science. And I think the science community is starting to, to twig onto that. Instead of trying to sneak you know, an extra watt out of a rover, you're talking about power systems that have tremendous capability and can support a lot of science. One of my other favorite examples, Dr. Zubruk and our head of science says, our first Perseverance rover sample, it took us about three days to figure out it was sandy and all the sand fell out of the sample tube. How long do you think it would take a human to go, oh, look at that, <laughs> maybe less than five seconds? So we really have the opportunity to maximize the science that we can do, but humans are fragile and we're beginning to have this discussion it's pretty annoying when one of your most powerful science instruments has to sleep eight hours a day and also needs time to eat and do other things. And that, that you know that's sort of the dismaying part for the science community about humans. So where are we going with all this? Well, the answer is human machine teaming. This is uh, one of my favorite subjects. I worked on it a lot when I worked at DARPA uh, about uh, seven or eight years ago. How do you optimize around humans and machines? So automation is one thing, but autonomy is another thing. I would love to say that we are there. If you're interested in autonomy and AI, you should go listen to the DARPA podcast on third wave AI. And they talk about, about where we're really at and where we're likely to get to. It is absolutely possible to optimize around a single thing. We can, we're learning how to do that very well. It's having a huge impact in industry and in other places. But what humans do is they optimize across multiple parameters at once. And that is extremely hard to do. So we need to figure out how, what, what do humans do best and what do machines do best and how to mix them together. So I'd just like to show uh, this slide so that uh, to remind you that we are going to be using a lot of hardware on the, on the moon that has heritage to Mars. And each of, of these pieces of hardware, we have to understand how humans will interact with them, how they will interact with each other to optimize the time for humans on the surface of the moon and Mars for science. So this is brand new, hot off the press. I love this. It's uh, actually the image through a helmet of an astronaut. And this is the intention to have something like an ingenuity-like helicopter. You have a heads-up display right there in your helmet. And in addition to that, you can communicate not just with others, but with uh, the rovers, uh, scientific equipment. And that's what I'm talking about. We have to figure out how to optimize around that. One of the things that really excites me is if we can actually get humans to Mars faster by not sending humans at all. If we had a very, very, very high, uh, well, we do, Mars Reconnaissance orbit, Orbiter can get to about um, 0.1 to 0.5 meter resolution. So if we had resolution that was down to 0.1 meter across the entire surface of Mars, and then we gave every citizen scientist a, a headset, and a, you know, a VR, and said, go take a walk. Would you please go take a walk on Mars for us and plant a little virtual flag wherever you see something interesting? Imagine that if we could have thousands of human beings sitting on Earth but walking on Mars and helping us guide the science for the future. All right, I think I'm out of time, so uh, I will finish. I think I have time maybe for one or two questions, but uh, I hope you will also be thinking about the human machine teaming and how we can get more science done on Mars. Thank you.
We have time for one question. Um, hi. Um, so please correct me on this because there's a chance I'm a little bit unclear. I'm not quite sure about the emphasis on sending humans faster because um, to me uh, it seems like most of the risks are associated with our presence on the surface of the planet so since you mentioned uh, to utilize the advantages of um, ntp i think that can just makes it cuts the time to half wouldn't that be more beneficial to utilize that in terms of you know, carrying more cargo because that seems to be contributing more for safety of our mission yeah, it's a great question. I, I think what I was trying to show was some of the complexity of these decisions. Uh, and what I what I didn't show is is the huge risks to humans. I mean, radiation protection for humans in deep space. That's something that we've got a notion of how to solve. We're gonna have to solve it on the moon, right? There, there's I mean, that's another whole thing is we're realizing we need to get better at predicting solar storms. If we've got humans cruising around on the surface of the moon or Mars, we need to predict them. We need to understand them and we forecast them, not just, oh, look at that, it happened. And so uh, the, the we, we think that there are ways to mitigate it once you're down on the surface, but we don't, we're not sure how to mitigate it completely on the trip. So we really need to go as fast as we can. And also some of that time frame may be in, you know, reduced gravity, all those things. So those are things we don't understand very well. Maybe, oh, okay. Before you go, before you go, Dr. or sorry, before you go, Deputy Administrator Melroy, we have a little gift for you. Um, we've researched all the Mars globes out there and we picked the fanciest one and we want to present this to you. Hold on one second. Oh, oh my gosh, that's beautiful. Look at that. We'd like to present this to you on behalf of NASA and the Mars Society working together on our shared vision of sending humans to Mars. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we also have one of those globes for Dr. Lal. Uh, we're going to give one to Dr. Lal, and also we'll get, we're going to send one to Administrator Nelson. So. Hello, Dr. Uzo Okoro. Um, we're getting set up here. Um, let's see. You can go ahead and try sharing your slides if you'd like. Uh, we cannot hear you at the moment. It doesn't look like you're joined to audio on your side in Zoom. Um, it should be just joining the audio on Zoom uh, in your Zoom client.
yeah, you could do that. that that'd be fine. Um, do you have Zoom on your phone? The Zoom application on your phone? Uh, let me, I can maybe give you a number to call. Let me do that real quick. One thing you might want to try, Dr. Uzo Okoro, is dropping from the meeting and rejoining. You may get an option at that point to join video to join audio when you do that. Is Michael Lane in here? Michael Lane? Nicole, will you go grab Michael Lane? Should be in one of the breakout rooms. Yeah, sure. I still don't see audio for you. Yeah, Zoom is a great tool, but unfortunately, a lot, a lot of our friends, a lot of our friends in government, are not able to use it for various reasons. Do you have the um do you have the zoom unmuted too? Okay, good. It's I think it's on her side because I don't see the audio joined. So I don't know if you can hear me, but do you have a headset for your computer, a USB headset? Yeah. 
Yeah, I, t I already did text her on there. Let me go back to my laptop and see if I can solve this over there. Are you able to hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Trying, trying.
Go ahead and say something. This is Ezene Uzo Okoro from the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Working? Yeah, we're good. Just give me one second. I'm just setting up the screen for you. Do you want to go ahead and share your slides? Oh, I don't have any slides. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, go ahead. Hello, thank you for your patience. I would like to welcome from the White House, Dr. Azine Uzo Okoro, and she will be presenting for us next. Thank you. You're all set, you can start out. Good morning, y'all. Um, I hope you can uh, hear me. All right, thank you for that uh, warm introduction. Coming through loud and clear. I, I am Ezene, uh, Ezene Ryan's with Resume, if we haven't met, uh, and I am um, the Assistant Director for Space Policy at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. And, you know, our office, uh, our mission is to maximize the benefits of science and technology to advance health, prosperity, security, environmental quality, and justice for all Americans. And the Office of Science and Technology Policy uh, focuses on three things. The first thing we do is we provide the president and others within the executive office of the president with advice on scientific engineering and technological issues. The second thing we do is we lead the interagency on science and technology policy coordination efforts. And the third thing we do is we serve as a source of scientific and technological analysis and judgment for the president with respect to major policies, plans, and programs uh, within the federal government, of course. Now, our portfolios vary, um, as does mine. Mine is typically focused on civil and commercial space, topics like space weather, microgravity, uh, Earth observations, orbital debris. Uh, aeronautics. Today, I will be talking to you about in-space servicing, assembly, and manufacturing, but I will build on what I talked about last year, where um, we will just uh, focus on what happens now uh, that we released a strategic um, vision. We released a national strategy for in-space servicing, assembly, and manufacturing. We expanded uh, what was uh, typically called on orbit assembly to in-space, uh, uh, on-orbit servicing uh, assembly and manufacturing to in-space servicing assembly and manufacturing. And the reason for that is something that I hope that this audience um, appreciates because um, we realize that while this is a very exciting time and there are lots of uh, technologies being developed um, for on-orbit servicing and on-orbit manufacturing and on-orbit um, assembly, they are also very relevant for um, work that we will do on surfaces. Uh, this includes uh, the lunar surface, which, uh, as you know very well, will lead to uh, efforts that will uh, be conducted on Mars. And um, lots of the services that will be conducted in um, basically any orbit, because we are orbit agnostic, will also be beneficial for work that will eventually be done on Mars. So that's one of the, the one of the goals or motivations behind expanding all of our capabilities and uh, technologies for servicing assembly and manufacturing to include, you know, the exploration of Mars so that we have a multi-purpose, um, just a multi-purpose, um, frame of mind as we're thinking about these uh, capabilities and technologies that companies are developing. So the, the, uh, to recap, the national strategy for in-space servicing assembly and manufacturing allowed us to start to develop policies to solve challenges and enable space commerce. And um, we know that sustained leadership in space is, is critical is an adoption of new capabilities. And we learned that there were three things that we needed to uh, overcome, three challenges in order to realize the benefits of these capabilities in space. So for on-orbit use, for uh, surface use, and for planetary use. 
The first is improving coordination and collaboration within the U.S. government um, and amongst uh, academia, amongst industry partners and international partners as well. The second thing we learned was uh, that we needed, the government needed to send a clear and consistent demand signal to the private sector so that it could stimulate investment, help to mitigate risks, and also address investor confidence. And uh, we need all the support uh, that the sector can get for um, technologies and capabilities that will be used on Mars. The third thing we learned is that we needed to establish and adopt uh, in-space servicing, assembly, and manufacturing, what we call ISAM standards, to help promote um, growth. And so, you know, we our, our six strategies that we developed uh, helps to cut across these multiple outcomes, um, human exploration, uh, lunar capabilities on the surface of the moon, which obviously leads to future exploration of Mars. And it helps to empower U.S. entities with varying interests, um, as I mentioned, to develop these multi-purpose technologies that will really enable a new space economy um, here on this planet for the benefit of exploration on the moon and on Mars. And we know that we need um, a coordinated and robust roadmap for how to integrate current capabilities and future uh, commercial capabilities to address the needs in, um, in about seven to eight years. And seven to eight years is because um, we see a shift happening with all the developments uh, going on in the private sector. Uh, numerous servicing and um, servicing and manufacturing capabilities and technologies, things like commoditized autonomy, things like refueling, tugs, um, additive manufacturing. You know, we are now asking a series of questions about how the U.S. government can help accelerate this um, exploration of surfaces, um, which includes the exploration of Mars. So, what are the kind of questions we're asking? Um, examples are. You know, which is the capabilities um, within the realm of in-space manufacturing and in-space servicing should be implemented within the next five years for the customers? Um, which of these technologies and capabilities are most relevant for NASA, for the Air Force, for the Space Force, for NRO? And what should we prioritize in upcoming budget cycles? You know, as we consider how to create a demand signal, what models should the U.S. government apply to the procurement of um, its procurement of commercial um, ISAM services? How do we accelerate the commercial sector's uh, technological innovation to continue to grow the economy? And are some of these tasks for the Department of Commerce alone or NASA and others how do we prioritize exploration of, um, of Mars today and uh, the technologies and capabilities that are needed? Um, in addition to what I've said a few times already, which is, you know, what we, what we um, develop for the moon will, uh, benefit, will uh, be of benefit to um, the exploration of Mars. And, you know, we also prioritize restoring America's global leadership in this administration. So how do we cooperate uh, more fully or even better with allied nations and partners? These are the kinds of questions that um, we are seeking to answer as we develop this in-space servicing assembly manufacturing plan, execute on the policy that we cre um, released last uh, April and um, enable a bigger space economy. Um, just to go over the six strat uh, strategic goals that uh, we included in our vision uh, to jog your memory, they are advancing ISAM research and development. The second is prioritizing the expansion of scalable infrastructure. The third is accelerating the emerging uh, ISAM commercial industry. The fourth is promoting international cooperation and cooperation to achieve these goals. The fifth is prioritizing environmental sustainability as we move forward with these ISAM capabilities and the six is inspiring a diverse future workforce 
as a potential outcome of all of the innovations that uh, we uh, intend to see. So this implementation plan that will implement these six goals uh, that I just rattled off will, will really help to um, create jobs in robotics and software and cloud networks, ground-based communications, the additive manufacturing space uh, craft component uh, development companies. We are looking to ensure that these uh, multi-purpose technologies um, help move us further um, and reduce the redundancy um, in our civil space programs and increase the um, a greater use of uh, commercial capabilities as we look towards the exploration of Mars. Uh, it will focus, the plan will focus on actionable steps for working towards um, fostering these uh, capabilities and technologies. And um, you you may have already heard and uh, we'll see uh, some changes in some of our civil agencies already as they begin to implement some of the ideas and concepts that we um, are coming up with as we answer those questions. I am very much uh, excited about our future, the future of in-space um, serving assembly and manufacturing technologies and how the commercial sector will work with our government to make advances in, in this uh, space manufacturing, space servicing culture across the entire um, space enterprise by supporting the standardization and adoption of interfaces um, in, in all of our space systems. This is very important for our um, travels and exploration of Mars and beyond. And um, I'm really excited about our resolve to build, to continue to innovate and to manufacture a future in space and on future planets. Thank you very much for your attention. Does anybody have any questions? No questions? Yes. One moment, please. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? One second. I guess it's not. <laughs> How about now? Can you hear me? Okay, yeah, I just wanted to comment that, that your idea of building Earth civilization and diversity is very important and is enhanced by our going out into space and seeing the Earth as just one thing. Just wanted to make that comment. Uh, thank you very much. More questions? Stand by. Doctor, could you comment on if these standards had been in place when we put the ISS up, would that have accelerated the ISS development? How, how will creating these standards make things go faster? You know, I would rephrase your question for the future, uh, but I'll start by answering it in its current form. I don't know that we can really know everything that we could have done um, better at the time. But I do agree with your general um, hypothesis there, which is that if we did have, and we do have some um, standardization of, um, of um, technologies and interfaces, and we currently do, that's how companies you know, dock onto the International Space Station. If we had more, would we have been, um, would we have created a, a more thriving sector? I think that there's a confluence of things that have led to the growth of um, space technologies um, writ large today. I mean, reusable rockets were not available um, to us in the way it is now uh, when the ISS was being built. The uh, you know, launch costs continue to, to drop. And uh, that's because of the incremental um, advancements being made by the commercial sector. It's by the, um, I think NASA deserves a lot of credit for um, the, the crew, commercial crew programs and some of the contractual vehicles and space act agreements that they've had in place to 
really accelerate the development that's happened that has happened in the commercial sector over the last 20 years. So I, we, given that we didn't have that, in addition to having um, increased standardization and uh, adoption of greater interfaces across our space systems, I don't know that that alone would have changed um, very much. But today, with everything, we really are at um, a, a critical juncture in history. Next question. Hello. One, one second. One second, please. Got a little rat's nest up here going on. Okay. Go ahead with your question. You mentioned about sustainable technologies. What are those technologies and how will they benefit the American people? It's a great question. You know, this administration released a United States space priorities framework on December 1st of 2021. The vice president released it at the inaugural Space Council meeting. And it had two, two main themes. The first themes were our space policies. And the second theme was um, how space should benefit humanity. And one of those top, one of the topics under that section was on uh, sustainability. How do we um, uh, mention, uh, just give you an example of that uh, orbital debris, for instance, how are we mitigating um, debris, which is how we prevent it before a launch? How are we tracking and characterizing debris when it's already there? And how are we remediating debris? So remediation of debris or repurposing it or recycling it, however you want to think about it, is a, an example of one of these uh, in space servicing and manufacturing capabilities and technologies. We are actively looking at um, how the U.S. government can play a role in accelerating the growing sector that, of active debris removal and how we can support companies and how we can support our mission concepts around um, making space uh, safer and more sustainable by um, reducing the amount of debris in space. Um, so you might be thinking, well, okay, you've answered the space thing, but how does it really benefit us here? Well, it does because the space is is um, safer and more sustainable and there's less um, debris than all our technologies that are in space that are used for the application for applications here on Earth. You know, precipitation is an easy example, weather prediction, crop yield uh, prediction uh, will be better. But more importantly, I mean, we also had um, recently in the last uh, three weeks, um, a NASA mission that um, deflected, so we directed an, ast an asteroid and uh, from coming towards us. So debris is not in the same category as um, an asteroid that's not man-made. Um, but debris does fall onto our planet sometimes. And so um, making, um, making technologies that help us to repurpose, remediate, and recycle debris also helps to keep us safer here so that we don't have um, debris uh, falling on to our planet. Thank you. Last question. Uh, thank you very much. Brian Bender with Politico. I uh, was going to ask you to look in your crystal ball a little bit. Um, you all have talked a lot about the Biden administration sort of stepping up its efforts to come up with this new kind of regulatory framework. How do you encourage in orbit servicing and this sort of whole new era of technology of how you, you know, launch, recover, reduce space debris? Do you have any sense of like what's coming down the pike? In other words, how soon might we see? The administration promulgate new policies. Are there presidential directives coming? I know you're, you're talking with the industry a lot, trying to figure out what is the best approach. But give us some sort of timeline, if you can, on when, when we might see something. Thank you. Thanks. We actually released an orbital debris implementation plan in July of uh, this year. So we have shown. Um, actionable steps that agencies are taking after 11 months of coordination and convening and discussion that out of uh, the EOP here, the Executive Office of the President, to 
um, steps that we are taking to address sustainability, space sustainability through um, orbital debris mitigation, tracking, and uh, remediation. So that's one place you can um, look at steps that agencies are already taking to do that. Um, as far as in-space servicing um, and actionable steps, uh, we are currently working on this. We have been uh, doing so since uh, the strategy was released last April. And um, we hope to wrap up those efforts in a few months. And again, when an implementation plan is released, uh, quite like the orbital debris implementation plan is released at the end of July, the budget cycle we were in um, was the end of the 2024 budget cycle. So most of those actions that were not already implemented yet will then be um, will then move to the 2025 uh, FY 2025 uh, budget cycle. Um, so for in-space servicing, um, in, in the coming months, as we release the plan, then it will, it will uh, move to the budget, the appropriate budget cycle at the time. We already have some plans out that you can take a look at for what we're doing um, and the timelines that the agencies will be accomplishing. With. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Uzo Okoro. We really appreciate your time today and enjoy the rest of your day and have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, folks, uh, that wraps up our morning session. A couple housekeeping announcements. We do have a merchandise table. It's in La Paz right now. We are gonna actually move it into this room uh, after lunch. And so you can come back here and uh, enjoy the one o'clock sessions. Uh, uh, definitely, I want to plug my own talk, which is going to be in this room at one o'clock. I'll be talking about the Mars Society and our programs and initiatives. But uh, there's lots of uh, options for lunch in this building. There's a great restaurant down the hall uh, that's a sustainable artisan restaurant. And then there's a bunch of, uh, you know, the dining halls downstairs. But uh, we're hoping you're enjoying the conference and we'll see you back after lunch. Thank you.